might bring me some more water. Okay, we're on. Thank you very much. For, and thank you very much, Wes, for the invitation. It was a real pleasure to be here. I'm sorry I couldn't be here last year. I was scheduled to come, and at the last minute I had a personal problem in the family and I had to cancel out. In fact, I canceled out today. I was supposed to be on the airplane. Uh, but um, you people are fabulous. I've been to BC before, uh, Victoria, and um, uh, the Canadians are just wonderful, hospitable people. I really have a lot of respect for you. Uh, I have to say that it's all really quite by accident that I'm involved in these issues. I was in the FBI 27 and a half years, had a very illustrious career. I was uh, chosen as the Outstanding Law Enforcement Officer of the Year in 1977 by the AFL-CIO Middle Trades Council Los Angeles. Um, I was, um, at the time of my retirement, one of the top executives in the FBI. I was in charge of Southern California as the chief. Uh, I um, had over 14 million people under my within my jurisdiction. I uh, retired. In fact, I retired early at the request of the Attorney General of the United States, who asked me to go to San Juan, Puerto Rico, and coordinate the security game, the uh, Pan American Games, in, in charge of security. I went down in the summer of '79 and uh, came back, established my own uh, consulting and international investigation business in Westwood Village, which is uh, in a part of L.A., right near uh, UCLA. And uh, then uh, subsequently I was a consultant for the 84 Olympics, and I was also a consultant for the California Narcotic Authority under then-Governor Jerry Brown. So uh, I've had a fantastic life, and uh, I really didn't know what it was all about, to be frank, the big, the big picture, the true story, until after I retired. And uh, what happened is, shortly after my retirement, I was contacted by a group of doctors from Long Beach, California, and they said that their friend, Dr. Jeffrey R. McDonald, had been tried and convicted of murdering his wife and two children at Fort Bragg. The murders occurred February 17, 1970. These doctor friends of Dr. McDonald said he was absolutely innocent. Would you investigate the case? Now, this is a case, by the way, uh, those of you, uh, some of you in this room, I'm sure, have seen the movie Fatal Vision. Would you raise your hands if you've seen the movie? It's a story of, uh, it's been widely publicized as the best-selling book, Fatal Vision, by a guy named, a fellow named Joe McGinnis. So uh, first thing I did was uh, go down and talk to Dr. McDonald. He was in prison at Terminal Island, San Pedro. And I told him, I said, Doctor, if you're innocent, uh, I'll work with you from now on. Guilty, I'm not going to work the case. The child was five and a half, the other one was two and a half, Colette was pregnant. So the story is this, Dr. McDonald said he uh, had uh, come home that evening, uh, went up uh, to the back bedroom, this up uh, two steps into the hallway and then back to the back bedroom, to go to bed late. Uh, the five and a half year old child was sleeping with Colette, the wife. She'd wet the bed, so he came back and went back on the couch. He fell asleep watching uh, uh, Johnny Carson. He was awakened by two white males and a black male with these six sergeant stripes and a fatigue jacket, uh, and a white female with a floppy hat and the long blonde hair. And um, he, uh, they claimed, uh, later on I talked to the uh, female and got a signed confession from her, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. They claimed that uh, they came in looking for drugs. And um, he said, just a minute, I'll go uh, call a friend of mine. And he went to call the friend. And uh, instead of calling the friend, of course, he called the MPs and a fight ensued. Uh, they had a knife, a, a uh, ice pick, and the black male had a club. And uh, he was over near the couch and somehow or other his pajama tops got wrapped around his wrist and he was fainting off the blows, and all of a sudden he felt a sharp pain to his right side. And he said to himself, well, that guy packed a strong blow. He lost consciousness. He woke uh, halfway in the hallway and halfway in the living room. And there was dead silence in the house. He went back. His wife had uh, multiple stab wounds in, her, in his chest. He went in and checked the two little girls. They'd been bludgeoned to death with multiple stab wounds. He called the MP. Uh, the MPs came, and uh, a fellow named William F. Ivory was the chief investigator for the Criminal Investigation Division Department of the Army. The story goes later on that uh, Ivory looked the area over, uh, looked at the upturned uh, furniture and the potted plant that had been uh, turned over, and decided he decided right then and there 
in 15 minutes that Jeffrey McDonald, Dr. McDonald, who was a Green Beret doctor at Fort Bragg, had staged these crimes. No motive, but he just decided he staged the crimes. The Army thereafter geared their investigation to prove the point that he was guilty. In America, of course, and up here, I think we're supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. I don't know if that's the way it is in Canada or not, but that's the way it should be. But the government claimed, even though they had no strong motive, uh, that he went up and the five and a half year old had wet the bed and he got in an argument with his wife and he slaughtered the whole family. Uh, absolutely uh, not true. The white male, the white female was chanting, acid is groovy, kill the pigs, acid is groovy, kill the pigs. Uh, Jeff, before he lost consciousness, heard his little daughter yell, daddy, daddy, help me, help me. He heard his wife yelling, Jeff, Jeff, why are they doing this to me? Why are they doing this to me? The, uh, the case uh, was tried in what, what we call an Article 32 Army hearing in uh, 1970, early 1970. And uh, as a result of the hearing, the Colonel Rock, who presided over the hearing, uh, said that Dr. McDonald did not commit these murders based on the evidence presented to him. And uh, therefore, uh, the uh, civilian and the military personnel should go out and check into a group of individuals, a hippie group, uh, in the area. Uh, the group was, uh, one of the members was a girl named Helena Stokely. The reason Rock said to do that is because the MP, Kenneth Micah, in route to the scene that night, uh, had passed a girl on the corner uh, with a floppy white hat, long blonde hair, and uh, he said normally if he wasn't in route to a call, he would have stopped and asked about her. Uh, but uh, he didn't, and when he arrived at the scene, he told uh, the lieutenant in charge, I think we should go check her out. They didn't go check her out. In addition to that, this girl, who her actual name was Helena Stokely, I was because she died in January 1983, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, Helena had mentioned to several people that she thought she was there that night, but she was high on drugs. Uh, long story short, they had a trial. In the trial, the judge said she's um, uh, a dopehead, she's not credible, and uh, there's no way that he was going to allow her to testify in front of the jury. In fact, she did not. Uh, when tried to, people tried to, to really pin her down and tried to get a, a formal statement from her, she would say, oh, well, I'm confused that maybe I wasn't there. So they never did really, they never did really uh, have a conclusion to it through uh, what we'd call legal evidence, signed statements and so forth. But um, anyway, I entered the case knowing this, and I learned that her handler, she was a drug informant for the Fayetteville Police Department, and years later, years later, I learned she was an informant for the Army, CID. Uh, and uh, the handler in the police department was a fellow named Prince Beasley, P.E. Beasley. And uh, in sizing up the case, I uh, went to Prince right away. I had to make up my mind whether he was an honest cop or he was dirty because right away I smelled drugs. And um, as a matter of fact, I was 100% right. It was a drug operation. It was a drug cover-up. And Prince had worked with this girl for years, and um, I decided that Prince was all right. He was an honest police officer. And Prince and I teamed up. So uh, the first thing we did was try to contact Lena because she had made these admissions but never had made any statements per se. And uh, we talked to her on the telephone through her brother in January, excuse me, um, uh, would have been in the January 1980, which is when I entered the case, right? And uh, Elena was not cooperative, told us to drop dead in so many words. Her husband, Ernie Davis, uh, also said, leave her alone. But in talking to her on the phone, I said, Elena, uh, look, I have inside information that you were there. I'll be honest with you, I didn't have that information. It's a little trick that we play, right? But it works. I said, I have inside information that you were there, and my inside information, I really wasn't fibbing because I had information from people she had talked to, right? And I said, you better make it easy on yourself because if you'll cooperate with me and Prince and give us the story now, uh, we'll have your side of the story rather than getting it from some other source. I had planted a seed. There's no question about it. It's a technique I've used for years. Uh, but she still uh, would not cooperate. Uh, I go through uh, February, January, February, into the summer. I develop uh, 19 new witnesses. 
One of the witnesses was her next door neighbor, uh, William Posey. Uh, Bill Posey said she came home that morning, or the morning of the murders, about 4.30 in the morning. He saw her get out. She was in a blue Mustang. Another witness I developed was a woman in Dunkin' Donuts. She said around midnight, a group of hippies came in, a girl in a floppy white hat, uh, and sat there for quite a while, 45 minutes or so. And then uh, one of them said, let's get it over with, and got up and walked out. The girl had candles stuffed in her pockets. Uh, and, uh, and then another witness I developed was a woman named Jan Snyder. And uh, Jan was a neighbor of Dr. McDonald's. And uh, early in the morning, around 4 o'clock in the morning, 3.30, 345, 4 o'clock, she wasn't sure. She was awakened by the sound of idling motors. And she looked out the window. She saw a blue Mustang, a, a off-colored Plymouth, and a, a military Jeep, MP. She talked about uh, the one car was under the street light. Uh, there, the man that was sitting on the passenger side could very well be seen with at ease, a great deal of ease, because the light was shining right in his face. Well, right after the murders, Dr. McDonald had given artist conceptions of the two white males, the black male, and Alina Stokely. I showed these artist conceptions to Jan Snyder. She identified uh, the person sitting in the passenger side that night as a fellow named Alan Mazarel. Uh, I showed the uh, picture uh, to the lady in Dunkin' Donuts, Frankie Bushy. She identified the girl as Helena Stokely, the girl in the floppy hat, from these artist conceptions. So I knew I was uh, on the right track. Um, now, what happened was, um, again, I developed these 19 new witnesses. Um, I went on into uh, the summer, didn't hear from Helena. And in October, Prince called me and said that Ernie Davis, Helena's uh, husband, had beaten her up, and Ernie was in jail. We needed $200 to get him out. Nobody would bail him out. I, I sent, I wired Prince $200 and said, Prince, go down, bail him out, if he will come to California and talk to us. Prince went down, we bailed him out, we brought him to California, and he gave us a statement. And the information he gave us basically indicated that Alina was at the crime scene that night based on what Alina had told him. So on the way to the airport, they let him go back to, he had to go back to uh, North Carolina and uh, appear at a hearing because of the uh, fact that he was out on bail. Uh, we're on the way to the airport, and I said to Prince, they're in the back of my car and I'm driving, you know that new witness we have is really going to help us? I pretended like I made a mistake, and I said, oh, I shouldn't have said that. And uh, sure enough, it worked. Ernie went back to South Car North Carolina, got out of the car, I found out later, I had made up with Alina in the meantime, told Alina, we got to get out of here. They have somebody on the inside. He went down to South Carolina. And uh, they kind of, bear in mind, I'm about to lose 200 bucks, right, from the bail money that I sent for Ernie. Uh, and uh, so uh, er, uh, Prince finds out where they are in South Carolina, told Prince to tell the local authorities. The local authorities wouldn't do anything about it. I told Prince, go down on your own and, and arrest him. Prince did, brought him back. And uh, after he arrested Ernie, uh, Helena was uh, there about five hours away. Helena told uh, Ernie, his, her husband, well, I'll hitchhike back. And uh, Prince said, no, nah, no, nah, get in the car. I will give you a ride back. So they got in the car, husband and wife, Ernie and Helena. And uh, Prince kind of stirred them up a little bit, got them to arguing. And uh, Helena said, well, you know, I think I will go back and talk to Gunderson. And uh, that's uh, all Ernie needed to do. And when they got out in North Carolina, Ernie attacked Helena, knocked her to the ground even though he had handcuffs on. And uh, they got this under control, put him in jail. And Helena turned to Prince and said, let's go back and talk to Gunderson. We brought Helena back. Uh, to, uh, uh, Prince brought Helena back to uh, Los Angeles, sat down, talked to her, got a, took a statement, signed the statement on October 25, 1980. Helena basically told, I'm working up to this case because I want you to have the background that this is the reason that I got into these issues about Satanism. Helena told us that she was a member of a satanic group. It was her initiation into the group that night. She was the one that was yelling asking this groovy kill the pigs. Uh, she talked to us about a, uh, when they entered the house there was a, a German shepherd uh, that barked as they left but didn't bark when they entered. She told us about a rocking horse in the child's bedroom the spring is broken, she couldn't ride it. She wouldn't have known that if she hadn't been in there that night. She told us about um, the uh, satanic um, uh, um, ceremony itself. 
Uh, we learned that uh, Bruce Fowler and the Blue Mustang had dropped the group off about a, a half a mile from Dr. McDonald's house. And they walked through the neighborhood chanting and with candles and robes and uh, en route to the, to the house. And this was part of the ceremony. One of the neighbors, a fellow named Milne, saw this, by the way. Uh, she also told us uh, and identified the uh, artist's conceptions as uh, Alan Mazarel, Dwight Smith, a fellow named Shelby Don Harris, and of course she identified herself. I asked Aline, I said, uh, now during this whole procedure, and she said that uh, Greg Mitchell, one of the other assailants, was in the back and fighting with uh, Colette. I said, Alina, did anything unusual happen that night? She said, no. Now, by the way, every, every time you talk to these people, you have them on audio tape, and if you can, videotape. In those days, I used audio tape. This was uh, 20, 20 years ago. I said, uh, think real hard, Alina, did anything unusual happen? And uh, she said, no. And the third time I said, think real hard, because I, I knew from my investigation that somebody had called in that night in the middle of the murders and tried to talk to Dr. McDonald on the telephone. And she finally said, yes, that something did happen. I said, what happened? You see, you have to answer, you have to quiz them this way because you can't put words in their mouth. She said, well, right in the middle of the ordeal, a phone rang. I said, tell me about the conversation. She said, somebody asked for Dr. McDonald. And uh, she said that uh, I laughed. And Dwight Smith said, hang up the GD phone, and I hung up the phone. In the meantime, there was another investigator before me who had talked to the person who made that phone call, and that's why I knew about it. So this confirmed, in my mind, that she was there. Now, the CID had come in, as I said. They basically uh, made the uh, statement that uh, they thought McDonald was uh, guilty. Uh, another person that she refused to identify, by the way, was a fellow named Wizard. She said and claimed she did not know Wizard's name. Well, I have learned just recently that Wizard was a fellow named uh, Francis Winterborn, and Wizard was a member of the Process Church of Final Judgment. Do you, any, you pe pe people know what the Process Church of Final Judgment is? It's a satanic group, uh, mainly out of the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, it was established in England, and they settled in the San Francisco, I mean, the, uh, the LA area, excuse me, yeah, the Los Angeles area, the Pasadena area. Uh, so we have now Helena saying that it was a satanic cult group. It was her initiation. She told us that the uh, individuals involved in the group, Alan Mazarel in particular, uh, were distributing drugs up and down the East Coast from New York to Florida after they were brought in in plastic bags in the body cavities of the dead GIs. And uh, these were brought in not only at Fort Bragg, but all over the United States. It was a large-scale drug operation. She told us about two attorneys being involved in it, generals being involved in it, police officers, and others in the Fayetteville area. So I knew by this time that uh, this was a big operation, and this was the reason that the CID refused to investigate. Uh, during the trial, there was an uh, FBI agent named Paul Stombaugh, and he claimed, uh, he took the pajama tops of Dr. McDonald, did an analysis of the ec entry and exit wounds, knife and t ice pick through the pajama tops, and uh, which were the entry, which were the exits. And then uh, just before trial, uh, Brian Murtaugh, the prosecutor, said, can you take those pajama tops and make a pattern by placing them on the stab wounds, the 21 stab wounds in Colette's chest? There were 48 uh, knife wounds and stab wounds in the pajama top. And they did, and the jury bought it. Unfortunately, it was a fraud. He had to reverse the direction, exit entry, of six holes after he'd already made that conclusion. And also, when you think of it logically, if you put a piece of cloth on an individual and you stab them, it's going to move after each stab, right? So there's no way you're going to establish a perfect pattern on that. Uh, I was surprised to learn that once I entered the case, the attorneys had not um, si filed for Freedom of Information Act requests. So I filed for a Freedom of Information Act request, and uh, it, it was in 1980. We didn't start receiving any material until 1983. The government tried to block us. Once we started receiving material, we checked the, uh, the documents that the government sent to us. We learned that skin under Colette's fingernails, Colette the wife, uh, was given to William Ivory, it disappeared. Now, you and I know from skin, you can tell the DNA of the person who was scratched. Dr. McDonald did not have any scratch marks on him. We learned uh, that 
the uh, fingerprint expert uh, lost, deliberately threw away, didn't lose, he deliberately threw away seven fingerprints because they were unknown and he said they kept becoming confused with the known fingerprints of other individuals who were there. We learned that there were some bloody syringes uh, that were in the, uh, ba the uh, ma uh, bedroom that night uh, that uh, nobody told the defense about. Bloody syringes did not belong to Dr. McDonald. This is something they would, could have and could have used in a satanic ceremony. Uh, we learned that there were fibers. Uh, we knew there were fibers in certain locations where McDonald fought with uh, assailants, yet they were not listed on the government chart. And uh, as I said earlier, we also learned that Helena Stokely was an informant for the Army herself, which would account for the fact that they didn't want uh, to uh, place her at the crime scene. So uh, we also developed information through the Freedom of Information Act that the FBI had obtained a confession from Kathy Perry, who was there that night also, and from Greg Mitchell. Uh, the FBI didn't interview him. He refused to cooperate, but Greg Mitchell had told one of his neighbors that he was there uh, that night. I learned during my investigation that the, uh, one of the prosecutors, Jim, James Proctor, was a former son-in-law of the judge, Judge Dupree, so we had a conflict of interest. It was, um, the judge, by the way, refused to recuse himself, and um, he um, stuck steadfast uh, as judge of the case through all the hearings. We, um, I developed information about uh, uh, one of, uh, later, years later, about one of Dr. McDonald's attorneys. He was involved in a large-scale drug operation. He ended up being murdered in Philadelphia. Uh, one of his attorneys at the present time uh, is a member of the Process Church of Final Judgment, which you find that kind of interesting. And, uh, you know, I told Dr. McDonald this. Uh, this fellow, John Markham, is uh, with the law firm of Silver Glade out of Boston, who is the chief attorney for Dr. McDonald, and uh, they've assured me that he does not have access to the files, but I still don't believe it. Uh, there was hair in Colette's hand. Paul Stombaugh lied about the hair. They took a piece of hair out of every part of Dr. McDonald's body. It didn't match the hair in her hand. Stombaugh claimed that it was uh, Colette's hair herself. You cannot make a statement like that. Hair can only be similar. There were foreign wax drippings in the house that did not match any of the wax that was, uh, or the candle that was in the house that night. Uh, there were wool fibers, we found out again years later. Two uh, wool fibers, two on her lip, Colette's lip, one on her chest, and two on the club. It was a 32-inch uh, bed slap, by the way. Um, the uh, CID and the uh, FBI laboratory classified these wool fibers as blue cotton polyester. On the official type report, it said blue cotton polyester. Once we went behind the scenes and looked at the laboratory handwriting notes of the expert, it said wool. There was no wool in the house that night, no black wool in the house that night. So I felt pretty good at this point about the, my investigation. Uh, we had uh, Prince Beasley, who saw uh, Helena that night, by the way, before the murders, about 10.50 p.m., and she was with a black male with a fatigue jacket, E6 Sergeant Stripes at the Apple House, a local hangout for hippies. At uh, 12.15, we had uh, Helena through uh, Artist Conception, through Bank Frankie Bushy at the Dunkin' Donuts. A little after uh, midnight, we had uh, Milne uh, talking about the ceremony, uh, walking down the street in robes, chanting with candles en route to the McDonald house. Uh, we had the dog barking. Helena said that there was a dog that barked, and there was a dog that barked that night because Janice Pendleshock, the lady to whom the dog belonged, said that her dog barked that night. Jan Snyder identified uh, Alan Mazarell from the artist conception that we had, and we had a 4.30, 4.45, Helena's uh, neighbor, Bill Posey, uh, confirmed that she came in late that night in a blue Mustang. Other witnesses identified uh, themselves, uh, the, the group, with a blue Mustang. So I kind of sit back. Oh, by the way, the latest development on the case is this. You won't believe this. You will not believe this, I assure you. We have finally, finally been able to get the courts to agree to a DNA test. They agreed to do a DNA test on this case in 1997, three years ago. Still have not done the test. 
Now, the judge said that you can open up 15 pieces of evidence envelope, 15 envelopes for evidence, but the defense cannot be present, only the prosecution can be present. So they opened up the envelopes, and of the 15 envelopes that were open, five of them are empty. Three years later, we still haven't done the test. So I'm feeling pretty good. I think that we have an open and shut case. And all my years as an FBI agent, very frankly, I'd never failed to interview a suspect or solve a case. It was a great record, except one case I had in New Mexico, in Kirtland Air Force Base, it was an old uh, bank uh, burglary. They blew a safe and all that. And, uh, but I got the case reassigned from somebody to me, so it really wasn't mine from the inception. But I'd never lost a case. I'd always obtained a confession. I felt good. I said, you know, we're going to turn this report over, 1,200-page report, to the FBI, and this man's going to be out in no time at all. That was in 1981, the spring of 81. Well, next thing, and I wrote a letter to Judge Webster, a personal letter. Webster was a friend of mine. I'd worked for him. I was one of the top executives in the Bureau, as I said. Probably one of the top uh, dozen jobs in the, in the FBI. Never received a response. I said, dear Judge, I have this... 1,200-page report I'm sending to you. I think this man's innocent, and I think that you should look into the possibility of his innocence. We've run out of money. I set forth 45 leads, leads that should be covered, and I said I, I would appreciate it if the FBI would continue with my investigation. Next thing I hear, I'm receiving phone calls from throughout the United States. I understand you're a homosexual. No. Yeah. I understand the words being spread that you're suffering from mental problems. That's probably true, I wouldn't be involved in these issues. Uh, that, uh, that you were a disgruntled ex-employee. And Tom Kelly, the agent in charge in Dallas at that time, even told a good friend of mine that I was trafficking drugs. So what are they going to do with an ex-FBI chief who comes along with a case like this and basically solve them. They have to discredit me. Why do they discredit me? Large-scale drug operation. Drugs being flown in from Southeast Asia. A CIA Army operation, joint venture operation. Now, for confirmation of that documentation, January 1, 1973, Time Magazine had an article on it. That's the only article I've ever seen about that drug operation in a national publication. OK? So I submit my 1,200-page report. And uh, basically, uh, I am accused of all these uh, various nefarious activities, uh, homosexuality and what have you. And then the next thing I hear is uh, that um, my witnesses are all being re-interviewed by the FBI. And in particular, Alina Stokely. And uh, so they go out and try to get them to recuse and change their statement. I'm saying to myself, you know, the FBI is supposed to solve cases, not unsolved cases. And the government isn't being paid to go out and take a fact and interview a person and try and get them to change a the story. These guys are supposed to go out and corroborate the information that I have. Well, it um, didn't work out that way. They uh, interviewed Helena, and um, in talking to Helena, uh, she refused to recant, but she was upset with me because there had been a big article in the Washington Post magazine, and I had arranged through the reporter for the article about the case and about her confession, and there was a picture of Helena in the magazine, she had in the uh, newspaper. She just obtained a babysitting job, and what do you think happened? when the parents of the baby saw her picture as a baby killer in the Washington Post newspaper. She lost her job. She was mad at me. And the FBI, obviously, with their wiretaps or whatever they were doing, uh, felt this was a good time to go talk to Lena. And they went and talked to Lena, and they tried to get her to recant. She didn't recant, but she did say she was upset with me, which was all right. I've had a lot of people upset with me. So uh, we rocked along. And uh, I didn't pay much attention to the uh, re-interview with Helena or with the others because I knew that the information I developed would stand and stand solid uh, because of the audio tapes. And in one instance, later, in uh, May of 1982, 
I even put her on videotape. After she was contacted by the FBI and they tried to get her to recant, she called me in May of 82. This is the FBI interviewed her in, in the summer of 81. She called me in May of 82 and she said, Ted, I want to talk to you. So I flew to South Carolina. She told me about the FBI interviews, told me she didn't recant, and uh, reiterated uh, information about the murders and about the drug operation and said that if she would be given immunity, she would tell all. She would give the names of the generals, the names uh, of the attorneys, and the names of the police officers, and everybody involved, and the people that were distributing the drugs. I sent uh, a letter to the Department of Justice asking for immunity for Alina, uh, and uh, her attorney, or not her attorney, but uh, Jeff McDonald's attorney, found out I did it, and um, he killed the letter. I don't know, I have my reasons why I think he killed it, but he killed the letter, wrote to the department, said don't pay any attention to Gunderson and his request. So um, then um, I received a phone call from Jeff McDonald's attorney, Brian O'Neill. O'Neill gave me a new case, only case he'd ever given me before or since. A fellow named Robert Ferrante had uh, walked out of his office about midnight had nothing to do with the McDonald case, by the way. Had uh, walked out of his house about midnight, not house, but his office. And um, as he started to get in his car, a gunman, a gunman jumped out of the bushes and uh, shot at him nine times, hit him five, but he lived. So O'Neill asked me to investigate the case. I found out that the afternoon or the evening, late, early evening of the day of the shooting, that a, an individual was seen in the parking lot by the accountant. Uh, with the trunk of the car up against the building and he was sitting there and uh, at the time of the shooting the same car or car of that same description was also there and so I took the accountant and we put him under hypnosis and we did an artist conception I came up with an artist conception I gave it to my client Ferrante who lived by the way and the first thing he said when he got to the hospital when the police started asking questions about who shot him and so forth he said um, I'm taking the fifth so it tells you a little bit about him and um, so my client had this artist's conception. And uh, next thing uh, I know, my landlady uh, leaves a note on my car. One night, I didn't go home. And I got up the next uh, day after that. And she said that um, she'd come home at 1.30 in the morning. And there were two men sitting across from my front door. One of them got out, walked over, and asked if she knew where Ted Gunderson lived. And I'd always told her, you, didn't, you don't know me, you don't know where I've lived, if anybody ever asked. And she said no, and then she went up and watched him. At a quarter or two, they left, these two men in the car. So I checked with some of my informants, and I found out at that time that there was a contract out on me. Um, now, I had uh, given this artist's conception to my client, Ferrante, and uh, I found out later that Ferrante took it uh, to uh, some Israelis that he was involved in a lawsuit with, and um, told them, my detective Gunderson is going to solve this case, and here's an artist's conception of one of the people involved in the shooting. Well, that was the wrong thing for him to do, obviously. I didn't know he did this. So a uh, long story short, um, I had a, did some checking. I had a contract out on me by the Israeli mafia. And um, then the next thing I know, um, by the way, as soon as I found out about these two guys sitting in the car across the front door from me, I checked in a motel with cash and stayed there for a week, and I had some friends staying at my place. And uh, the following Friday, there were 13 dead red roses and 13 dead chrysanthemums placed on my front porch. When my friend got up, w walked over, opened the door to get the newspaper, there were these dead roses and dead chrysanthemums. They were dried and they'd been painted black. So I called uh, my, two of my sources, and I said, what does that mean? One of them says, it means it's probably hit on you. And uh, the other one said, if, it's not, if there's not a hit, there's, you're, you're, that's a warning to back off. Um, so I'm saying, you know, I think I better get out of Dodge. And, um, but before I do, I got to make an effort to get these contracts taken care of. Now, I'm telling you about these now because these contracts fit right back into the government and the work that I'm doing, okay? I'm laying the groundwork for you. So I contact a couple of my sources again. And by the way, in this business, you're only as good as your sources and your contacts and your confidential informants. 
And um, they're both ex-cons, and I say, can you help me out? And they say, sure, let's go see so-and-so. So I won't name him. But this fellow that we went to see was cocaine king of the West Coast. Uh, so we make an appointment on a Monday after the Friday that the roses and the chrysanthemums are dumped on my front porch. And uh, we go up to the front door, knock on the door, and the guy in the artist's conception answers the door. So I'm saying, I wonder if I got the wrong house here. And of course I didn't. But at that point we went in. I knew they weren't going to do anything to three of us. So we went in, we sat in a parlor. He had a couple of females in there he's playing pool with. Uh, rough, rough looking guy, a rough guy himself, a tough guy, a hit man obviously, or at least involved with the hit team. And then uh, pretty soon he took us into a side room. Wait here. The cocaine king of the West Coast came in. By the way, before he came in, his dog came in. Smelled all of us, sat down at my feet, and went to sleep. And he came in and he said, my dog likes you, I like you. And he told the other fellows to get out of the room. I'm sitting there, and uh, first question he asked me is, um, how many children do you have? What he was saying is, you know, if you don't do, you play your cards right, your kid's health's in danger. And I told him, and then he took the artist's conception out and handed it to me, see, where'd this come from? And I told him, I says, you know, if you're going to do anything to the person that gave this to me, I'm not going to tell you. I'll take the heat myself. And he was kind of set back and offended by that. And I, and I said, no, I, I won't tell you where it came from. And he said, finally, he says, OK, I won't do anything. I said, well, I told him the story about how Robert Ferrante's accountant walked through the parking lot at 6.30, and this uh, car was sitting there, artist conception, and so forth. So I guess he admired me standing up to him or what. I don't know, whatever it was, either his dog or something. He said, uh, let me leave the room. I'll be right back. He left the room, came back 15 minutes later. You got two contracts set on you. He says, I can take care of one, but I can't take care of the other one. I can't take care of the one out of Florida and Houston. Um, but he could take care of the one involved in the Israeli mafia. This was on a Monday. He said, don't go back to your office or home until Friday. So um, I took care of the one, and then I had to go underground. I had to leave the area. Uh, I went to work for F. Lee Bailey for about uh, six or eight months. As a matter of fact, I handled that investigated that drunk driving case he had in uh, San Francisco, California. For six weeks I was there. Then I was in Dallas most of the time. Uh, did some work for him in Amarillo, Texas and in New Mexico. It took me a while to get the second hit taken off. And I found out that the second contract was by the satanic cult group out of Florida and Houston. And um, the way I did that is um, I made some more phone calls and I was placed in contact with an individual who was reported to me as head of the hit squad for George Bush's White House team. He was NSC, National Security Council. The National Security Agency handles communications. The National Security Council is right out of the White House. They don't answer to anybody but the President of the United States. They don't answer to Congress, to anybody. The FBI answers to the Department of Justice. CIA uh, answers uh, to who knows who the CIA answers to. They're supposed to answer to Congress, but they don't. They have so many black ops that nobody can keep track of them. So um, I uh, fly to L.A., have a meeting with this individual, and um, he tries to drink me under the table, and one day I could drink with anybody. I don't drink anymore, basically. And I think because I, he couldn't drink me under the table, he admired me, respected me, which is kind of a stupid thing to think about, but that's the way those, some of those people are. And we developed a very close relationship. He ended up taking the second hit off, uh, a contract off on, for me. Incidental to that, I was placed in, uh, in the company of a number of CIA-type individuals and, and people. And uh, I was uh, right then, told right then and there that, you know, you better be careful, you better back off, uh, you better forget about um, getting into these issues. I didn't. Uh, this uh, fellow and I are no longer friends, by the way. But then I started having a series of surveillances and phone calls, uh, and um, I've had um, not only those two gunmen waiting for me, I had a gunman waiting for me, a fellow named Bill Menser in 1986 in Calabasas. I was living in Calabasas. I don't need to go into details on that, but I did confirm that he had uh, come into my house, waited for me from 11 till 2 in the morning. Bill Menser is a satanic cult drug killer for the government. 
Uh, he was convicted subsequently, by the way, for the murder of a Hollywood producer named Roy Radin out of Long Island, New York. And um, I was partly responsible for that conviction. So uh, I not only sent him up, but his three accomplices. And instead of getting me, I got him, and he's in jail now for life. All four of them are. I had another case, um, a fellow um, uh, was um, CIA. And um, I learned that uh, he was arranging for contract killings. And I went to the FBI with the information. They wouldn't do anything. I went to the Riverside County Sheriff's Office. They began an investigation. Pretty soon the investigators pulled off, put on stolen cars. And so I go to the chief of police, uh, Sam Cross in Indio, which is where the fellow was from. And I knew Sam, and I said, Sam, this guy's arranging for contract killings. And um, Sam said, well, I don't like that. I said, that's good. I said, here. What are you going to do about it? I'll, I'll take care of it. He sent a young cop in right out of training school. The cop was wired. And uh, this individual was caught with uh, arranging for five contract killings. Am I on the mic back there? Um, so he ends up. All right, OK. So he ends up. Uh, um, going to jail for three years, and when he got out, he arranged uh, to have Mincer come after me. Um, so the surveillances that I had were, uh, were rather obvious. They, were, they would wait uh, half a block up from my home, just sit there. And um, I'd spot them, and I would uh, put my gun on, get in my car, and uh, drive up about three miles an hour, look at them, do a U-turn, three miles an hour back, do it again, then come in and park behind them. And uh, they'd get nervous, and I'd be watching them in the rearview mirror. I'd be behind them watching them. And all of a sudden, they'd take off. I had two of those. One fellow, I cornered him down around the corner. He thought I was going to do something to him, and his eyes got, you know, big as saucers. Another uh, incident was in Long Island, not Long Island, but uh, Long Beach. Uh, I was walking my, my uh, staying on my daughter's, walking my dog one midnight, and I saw some fellow about a quarter of a block up sitting in the car darkened. And uh, so I walked back with the dogs, put them in, put my gun on, went up, walked up to the front of the car with my paper and pen and started writing his license number down, walked around the back of the car, wrote his license number down, walked up to the window. I said, get out. I don't know who you are. I've, been, I've seen your type before. And the guy's going like this and locking all his doors. And he says, he says, no, no, I'm waiting for somebody. I said, yeah, I've heard that story before. And just about this time, I hear the door open across the street in a house. And it was true he was waiting for somebody. <laughs> So I said, gee, you know, I'm sorry. Thanks very much. And I, and I, I didn't walk right to my daughter's house. I didn't want him to know where I lived. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I've laid the groundwork for, uh, it was, I mean, here I am. Here I'm an ex-FBI chief, uh, come out with all kinds of honors. I solved this case. It involves drugs, involves the government, involves contract killers, hit CIA, and all this. And I'm saying, what in the hell is going on in America? I just can't believe it. I have this 1,200-page report that's being ignored. Uh, uh, FBI agents are lying on the witness stand, which was Paul Stombaugh. By the way, I found out later that in a magazine article, one Paul M. Stombaugh was expelled from Russia because he was a CIA agent. I find that very interesting. I also learned that there was an individual on the McDonald defense team who was a contract attorney for the CIA for years. So they're planting. They planted people on me. They planted people on McDonald. I've had at least a half a dozen people planted on me. And um, what did they do? How did they justify the wiretaps on me? Well, I had a fellow named Bill Craig, CIA, by the way, say that he had a friend named Mark Tilden. Now, I can name these names because I hope they do sue me, who was, uh, had some information that he wanted to pass on to the White House. Uh, Mark Tilden, uh, supposedly, uh, I talked to him. I said, what do you want? What do you, why can't you go through the CIA? He said, well, he said, I need to get right to the White House and go right into the Reagan administration. I don't trust the CIA. He said, okay. So I made a phone call to Washington. I arranged for Mark Tilden to go into the White House. Uh, I, even, I was back in Washington the, uh, sometime later when he was there. I even escorted him to the side door. And he got out of the car and went on in. I found out later Mark Tilden was actually a KGB agent named Rotor Ivanov, spoke perfect English, 
I was set up by Bill Craig with Ivanov, otherwise known as uh, Mark Tilden, in order to justify the FBI to do a counter-espionage or an espionage investigation of me and to run their wiretaps legally in the interest of national defense. Um, under the Freedom of Information Act, I requested information from the FBI, and I found out that I had four investigations of me. Obviously, this is one of them. So from there, uh, I just kept on going. Surveillances that didn't matter. Uh, I had my, my uh, phone staffed in my office. I had a, a contact inside the phone company, and um, I knew my phones were being tapped, but if I came forward with the information, I'd have to expose my source, and he'd be fired, and maybe even prosecuted, so I couldn't do that. So I lived with it. And then one day, I received a bill, um, and I had an office manager before this, but I had to let her go because my finances were going down, down, down. And uh, I was paying my own, writing my own checks, and I received this bill, and I looked at it. It was from the phone company, and it said, 40 some, $42, $7 a mile for the extension to your telephone answering service. And I'm saying to myself, that's funny because I don't have a telephone answering service. There, I've got another one. So I called the phone company. I said, would you give me that in a letter and so on and so forth? And they did. And uh, what they were doing, uh, they had a answer all telephone answering service on 5900 West Pico in Los Angeles. And they were running that as a front and tapping all kinds of telephones. I went down there. By the time I got down there, there were about 150 lines coming in. Somebody had cut the lines coming into the building and um, made off with all their equipment. So I filed a lawsuit against GTE. Um, I couldn't get an attorney to handle it. I finally had an attorney that went just so far. We got up to the first deposition, and he wanted out. I think he was paid off, to be honest with you. And so I settled out of court for a minimal fee. So I had these wiretaps. I, had, I was a homosexual and uh, suffering from mental problems and uh, what have you, uh, but, and had the surveillances on me. Uh, it didn't bother me. I just kept right on going. I became involved in the case in Nebraska. It's called the Franklin Cover-Up. And in that particular case, I learned uh, that they were, uh, uh, there was an international child kidnapping ring operating out of Iowa, Nebraska. They had uh, the Franklin Savings and Loan was raided by the IRS and the FBI. As a result of the publicity, 80 children came forward and said that they were part victims in a large-scale pedophile ring. Of the 80 who came forward, four gave statements, two recanted, two refused to recant, Lee Owens and Paul Benassi. Uh, the two refused to recant. I went back and interviewed them. I talked to them. I uh, helped develop the case. The investigator before me was murdered, by the way. And uh, the, uh, I, I didn't really replace him because he was a full-time investigator, and John DeCamp had just asked me to come back and kind of fill in until like, we could uh, you know, uh, work it more extensively. Uh, but we we learned from talking to these kids that uh, this large-scale pedophile ring was not only involved in pedophilia, they were involved in pornography, uh, they were um, involved in satanic cult activity. Uh, the kids were uh, attended these ceremonies with robe chanting, human sacrifices, uh, and uh, these were not dirt bags off the street. This was the past publisher of the Omaha World Herald. This was the chief of police, Bob Wadman. This was the head of the Nebraska Forestry Service, Eugene Mahoney. These kids named all these individuals, some of the top citizens in Omaha, Nebraska. So um, the case went actually nowhere. The main agency that blocked it, kept it from going forward, was the FBI. But uh, they were taking these kids out of orphanages, foster homes, Boys Town. They were driving them in pr uh, private limousines from Omaha, Nebraska to Sioux City, Iowa, placing them in private jets, flying them to Washington, D.C. Uh, for sex orgy parties with congressmen and senators. And of course, they would blackmail the congressmen and the senators. Uh, Paul Benassi, one of the kids who was talking, uh, told me about how when he, he was, by, by this time, he was about 21, 22 years old, told me how when he was uh, 14, 15, 16, um, they would take him out and uh, to a shopping mall, a park, uh, a public place to try to attract the kids over uh, his age over near the car. The adults would grab them, make off with them, and put these kids in a safe house and um, so forth. Paul told me, asked me, I said, what do they do with these kids, Paul? He said, well, they auctioned them off, and uh, he'd been to two such uh, two locations, uh, Las Vegas and Toronto, Canada. 
I said, how many auctions have you attended? He said, six. And uh, I said, how many kids were auctioned off at each one? He said, there were as few as six and as many as 36. I said, how, many, uh, how much money do, these, do they get for one of these kids? They're, they sell for $50,000. 36 times $50,000 is a bundle of money. What happens to the kids afterwards, Paul? They're using satanic ceremonies. Uh, they're put on airplanes, uh, foreigners that don't speak English, planes with no markings on them. Now, wait a minute, FAA's got to be involved in that. We got planes coming in here with no markings? Huh? Or whatever. Um, they're uh, put in campers. Uh, they're uh, sent overseas, probably for, uh, well, I've been told, uh, for body parts, for sex slaves, and what have you. In uh, November the 7th, uh, 1997, I was in Denver, Colorado on a lecture. We picked up information that a car, an airplane, uh, with the children from Child Protective Services in the state of Colorado was serviced at Denver International Airport there were two men and a, and a female woman, and the fellow that serviced the airplane asked, what are those kids doing here? There were 210 kids. And she said, Child Protective Services, none of your business. The plane, he checked the manifest, the plane was uh, going to New York to refuel and then going on to Paris, France. Big business, right? So Paul said that um, he was part of the kidnap ring. There have been several attempts to, uh, to kill Paul, John DeCamp, an attorney, filed a lawsuit against Larry King, who was the leader of the operation and the president of the Franklin Savings and Loan. Not uh, Larry King uh, live TV, but a black man. And uh, he had a million dollar judgment uh, February the 9th of uh, last year. Received a million dollar judgment. So we do have some good documentation. I have the, the documentation paying the telephone company, I mean the telephone company paying me we got the million dollar uh, judgment and so forth. Um, so um, in addition to the Nebraska case, uh, later in uh, 1990, the spring of 1990, how many of you have heard of the, the McMartin case? The McMartin case was a preschool, Manhattan Beach, California, longest trial in the history of the country, two years. The kids said uh, that when they were dropped off in the morning by their parents, picked up at night, between that time they were uh, victims of a satanic ceremony. There were tunnels under the school. Uh, they had witnessed uh, human sacrifices. Uh, they were flown into the mountains for ceremonies. And uh, of course, uh, the uh, authorities uh, said that, well, these kids are all hallucinating. The kids uh, uh, claimed that, that there were these tunnels. They said that they told uh, the authorities where the entrance was and everything else. The authorities went out there in 1987, couldn't find any tunnels. In the spring of 1990, I heard that the property had been sold from the McMartin to, and given to Danny Davis, the attorney, and he had sold it to a contractor. They were going to build uh, an office building on the property. And uh, so I went to the contractor. I said, uh, would you do me a favor? Let me have that property for two weeks. And um, he said, yeah, but you got to sign liability. you got to sign a contract. Went to an attorney friend of mine, and he wrote up a contract. And uh, I went out there, and at the end of two weeks, by the way, we couldn't document there had been tunnels under the school. But we did uh, extend it up to 34 days. And right at the very beginning, we hired a, an archaeologist, Dr. Stickle from UCLA. And we, he brought his team of archaeologists out. And uh, we found tunnels under the school that had been filled in. And. Um, the kids said that they were taken through these tunnels up into the triplex next door. There was a trap door in the bathroom. And they were placed in automobiles and transported out in the community, two, three, four-year-old kids for prostitution purposes. And I found, I found a book, by the way, in uh, my research, How to Have Sex with uh, Babies, Infants. Uh, and uh, these people are sicko. Um, the kids were telling the truth. There's no question about it. There was a, the first trial was a hung jury for Bray Bucky, and his uh, grandmother was acquitted. We were right in the middle of the second trial when we found the tunnels. Uh, I called the investigator. He came out, Mr. Perez. He wanted to argue with the archaeologist and say there were no tunnels. What are you talking about? And uh, we, they could have used uh, the evidence for the, the tunnels in the second trial. They didn't. They refused. Uh, before the case, right after the case broke, I knew where the kids were flown. They were, there was an airport about 10 minutes away. Uh, at Hawthorne Airport, 
uh, one of the friends of the, of the McMartin family had a jet, private jet. Uh, Crestline was about a 20 minute uh, flight from uh, Hawthorne Airport. I uh, was tipped off that this is where the kids were taken. I went up there, I took pictures. Um, I have those pictures, by the way. I usually show them at, uh, at m when I uh, give a lecture when we don't have the facilities here. And uh, there's no question about it. That was the location. I talked to the prosecutor before, before the first trial. And by the way, the house on this property burned down the day that the um, publicity broke on the McMartin case. And I talked to the uh, prosecutor. I said, this has to do uh, with Satanism. And uh, I know where the kids were taken based on everything that I've been able to develop. I'll be glad to take you up there, take the kids up there. We're not interested. Now, what, what did the kids do? Well, you know who they identified? Household name actor, baseball players, professional, professional football players, the son of the most prominent politician in Los Angeles. It cost the Los Angeles taxpayers $15 million, by the way. That case did. So um, what do you have? Well, let's see. We've got cover-up in the McDonald case. We've got cover-up in the Nebraska case. Now, most recently in the Nebraska case, Franklin cover-up, the photographer, Rusty Nelson, when the case broke, he disappeared. And he was the official photographer, and he went to Washington, D.C., took pictures with the congressmen and the senators, and uh, we found out that he had taken some pictures on his own and mailed them back to his family for, for his insurance, right? We also learned that uh, Gary Caradore, the investigator before me, had flown to Chicago, met with Rusty. Rusty gave him a briefcase full of pornographic pictures with these prominent citizens in sexual acts. And um, Gary Caradore, the investigator, called uh, a state senator that night that uh, Rusty gave him these pictures, he said, Senator, I've got the smoking gun. I'll be flying back tonight. Rusty, or, uh, Gary Caridori had his own airplane. He took off about 1.30, his plane exploded in midair, came down, he died, of course, and his eight-year-old son died. They'd been back there together. He flew his boy back there. Saw the all-star game, went over and talked to Rusty in the meantime. Rusty disappeared. Three years ago, John DeCamp, the attorney I'm working with, by the way, I'm going back to uh, going to Lincoln next weekend for a, a speech in Lincoln on, uh, at the request of John DeCamp. Um, John DeCamp, um, um, I forget, I lost my train of thought right there. Uh, uh, the airplane blew up and now John DeCamp located, we located Rusty in jail in Portland, Oregon here uh, about three years ago. And uh, we went out, John DeCamp went out and um, talked to him, and he had been arrested with uh, no tail light. And when they arrested him, they searched his car, they found some pornographic pictures. Uh, John learned from Rusty that uh, he had tens of thousands of pictures of these prominent politicians, Washington, D.C., congressmen, senators. He had uh, planted them in a, the trunk of an old car near Taos, New Mexico, and also in the mountains, in a cave in Colorado. John uh, went to Taos, New Mexico, the exact location where the car was. He was met by the sheriff and told he could not uh, come onto the property. We have still have not been able to get to the mountains in Colorado. In the meantime, John brought Rusty Nelson back to Nebraska and as a parole violator. And he was recently uh, arrested, excuse me, uh, out on parole. And he was recently arrested as a parole violator and uh, sent back to Oregon. We're concerned about Rusty's life. Uh, by the way, there is, um, if you want information on this case, for those of you uh, who have um, the websites, you can write this down. Uh, here's a mail, email. Write to this email and she'll send you the 55 page report that I did on Rusty Nelson. It also explains the Nebraska case. It's capital N, capital G, small O-S-H, O-S-C-H, capital N, capital G, small O-S-C-H, at AOL.com. That's capital N, capital G, small O-S-C-H, at AOL.com. Anyway, that's Noreen Gosh. Noreen Gosh's 12-year-old son, a newspaper boy in Western Moon, Iowa, was kidnapped by this group of, uh, out of Omaha, Nebraska, part of the ring. What did I learn 
from the Nebraska case. Well, Rusty Nelson has gone back to, uh, let's say, Nebraska, he's gone back to Oregon. We don't know what's going to happen there. But I learned that there is a large-scale international um, ring operating out of Washington, D.C. It's a covert CIA operation known as the Finders. And they are actually involved in kidnapping children. That's their mission. Uh, I was able to gain access to a U.S. Customs report. And in 1987, Tallahassee, Florida, the police department, the mall? How come nobody else had any trouble? I have all these problems. You predicted that. That's uh, it's Satan at work. Don't tell me. I know. I know that guy when he operates. You got it. You got me back. I, how long have I been off? Oh, a couple of seconds. Okay. Okay. The Tallahassee Police Department, February five nine. This is, by the way, is in a report that I. I've got some dynamite uh, documentation, folks. It's in a report that I put together called Documentation New World Order. Um, I got, gained access to a Department of the Treasury United States Customs Service investigation. I have the report right here in front of me. And in, on February the 5th, 1987, the Tallahassee Police Department was anonymously called, uh, and uh, there were two men, six children, ages two to six, in the park. The children had, were, uh, had been bit, bitten with uh, uh, mosquitoes, fleas, and everything else, insect bites, they were dirty, they were not wearing any underwear, and all the children had not been bathed in days, and the two men uh, who were well-dressed in a van, Dodge van with a Virginia license, Michael Houlihan and Douglas Ammerman. The children uh, in this report, by the way, are identified and gives their names and their ages, and they said they were going to Mexico to a school for smart kids. So the customs uh, was called into the case because they thought there might be pornography involved. And this customs agent um, in D.C. went over to the Metropolitan Police because the Tallahassee Police had notified the Metropolitan Police in Washington, D.C. They obtained a search warrant, went out, uh, and searched the premises of the location of this organization known as The Finders. Um, they found um, that the kids were en route to Mexico to attend a smart school. The children were unaware of the function and purpose of the telephone, television, and toilets. The children had stated they were not allowed to live indoors and were only given food as a reward. This is quite an extensive report, about 12, 14 pages long. Um, the Metropolitan Police, by the, the way, the locations of the finders, 1307 4th Street Northeast and 3918 3920 W Street Northwest in Washington, D.C. Uh, the Metropolitan Police said they had an informant who talked about uh, rituals that had been performed at the finder's location, uh, sex orgies involving children, and there's supposed to have been an unsolved murder that was committed there. Um, there were instructions on uh, the impregnation of female members of the community, known as the finders, purchasing children, trading, and kidnapping. There were telex messages using MCI account numbers between a computer uh, terminal be believed to be located uh, in the same room and others across the country and in foreign locations. And this report goes on and on and on. Now, um, there, were, uh, there was communication for children, the transporting of children, London, Germany, the Bahamas, Japan, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Africa, Costa Rica, and Europe. There was also a file identified as a Palestinian and so forth. Now, I'll jump right over to the last page. Oh, by the way, they talked about terrorism. Uh, they talked about uh, bank accounts, uh, international uh, financing, and so forth. OK. This uh, customs agent went to, the, to receive a final briefing March 31, 1987. I contacted uh, Detective James Bradley of Washington, D.C. Metropolitan Police Department. I was to meet with Bradley to review the documents seized pursuant to the two search warrants executed in February 87. The meeting was to take place April 2 and 3, 87. He talks about having arrived there, but Bradley wasn't available, so he talked to somebody else. I was advised that all the passport data had been turned over to the State Department for their investigation. They were, the passports were located in the van, and that's why they brought in the State Department. 
The State Department in turn advised Metropolitan Police that all travel and use of the passports by the holders of the pass passports was within the law and no action would be taken. This included travel to Moscow, North Korea, and North Vietnam uh, from the late 50s to the mid 70s. Travel was illegal at the, that time in those countries, by the way. The individual further advised me of circumstances which indicated that the investigation into the activity of the finders had become a CIA internal matter. The Metropolitan Police report had been classified secret. It was not available for review in the interest of national security, of course. I was advised that the FBI had withdrawn from the investigation several weeks prior to that and that the FBI Foreign Counterintelligence Division, that's Division 5, had directed the Metropolitan Police Department not to advise the FBI Washington Field Office of anything that had transpired. No further information will be available. No further action will be taken. No action will be taken on the basis of this report. I uh, did a little checking on the finders after that. Here's what my source came back. The Finders is a CIA front established in the 1960s. It has top clearance and protection in the assignment task, assignment task of kidnapping and torture programming young children throughout the United States. Members are specially trained government kidnappers known to be sexual degenerates who involved uh, the kidnapped children in satanic sex orgies and bloody rituals as well as murders of other children and slaughter of animals. They use a fleet of unmarked vans to grab targeted children from parks and schoolyards. In doing so, they use children within their organization as decoys to attend the victims, attract the victims close to the vans where they are grabbed by the adults. Same thing as Paul Benassi told me earlier. Uh, they then drug the children and transport them to a series of safe houses for safekeeping. Paul said that as soon as they get them in the back seat of the car, they put chloroform over their faces and that's, they put them to sleep right away. They are then used in their uh, ceremonies uh, for body parts, sex slaves, and some are auctioned off at various locations in the Northern Hemisphere. In the past, they have been auctioned off near a location in Las Vegas in Toronto, Canada. Marion David so-and-so is the leader of the cult and he is an identified homosexual and pedophile and a CIA officer. His son was an employee of the CIA proprietary firm, Air America, which was notorious for smuggling drugs destined for the United States out of the Golden Triangle into Saigon during the Vietnam War. How am I doing on time, by the way? Huh? I just started? Wow. Okay. Um, anyway, in my fr let me just mention a couple things. I, this is just, you know, it really tears me apart to see these kidnapped kids, and, and the Reader's Digest, July 1982, says there's 100,000 children disappear every year and are never heard from again. 100,000. Now, the great FBI can tell you how many cars were stolen last year, how many aggravated assaults, how many uh, rapes, statutory rapes, how many bank robberies, but they can't tell you how many kids disappear every year. This is an estimate by the Reader's Digest. This article, July 1982, specifically points that out. Where is the FBI? Where's the federal government? Now, if you stop and think about it, 1982 to the present, 100,000 a year, that's quite a few, that's several million people. Kids, kids, children. I receive complaints from parents every week about where'd my child go. I had a lady come here last night just to meet with me because she heard I was going to be here. I'm going to meet with her um, Tuesday. Her child, uh, I, I can't go into details because I don't want to jeopardize anybody, but it involves a satanic cult and the kidnapping and the murder of a kid, of a child, a little infant. These kids in the McMartin case talked about babies being thrown into the fire. I have a case out of Philadelphia, Lou Bear. Uh, he hadn't seen his children in uh, something like seven or eight years. I went back in the late 80s, early 90s, whatever it was, to testify for Lou. And what happened is Lou got tired of the court system. He couldn't uh, get relief from the courts because they took his baby, they took his children. His ex-wife has him with her boyfriend who's a satanic cult activist. And the courts refused to consider that possibility and Lou lost his kids to his ex-wife and, and the boyfriend. 
And the kids would come home and tell them, Daddy, they're doing this to me, they're doing that to me. We're talking about group sex, and we're talking about exposing them to murders and homicides. And we're talking about cutting up babies, and we're talking about throwing them in the fire, as the, as the McMartin kids had said. So uh, Lou got tired of it. And one day, Lou, Lou had visitation, and he just took his kids and kept on driving. And uh, the great FBI ran him down eventually. He had him for several months. And I have a number of cases like that where the great FBI runs him down uh, and um, brought him back. And he hadn't seen his kids, as I said, in like seven or eight years. Um, but I was going, in the process of going through the court system, I was attempting to help Lou. And when he had the kids in his possession after, they, uh, after he left, uh, he didn't uh, really push him on what happened and so forth. He just kind of let nature take its course. And the kids were drawing these pictures. They were drawing pictures of babies being thrown in fire and of uh, uh, people in, standing around chanting and people in robes and, and that, that sort of thing. And so as a so-called expert on Satanism, uh, Lou sent me the pictures and I said, Lou, uh, I can testify that based on my experience, in these type cases that your children have been exposed to satanic uh, cult activity. Now the telltale picture of all was a totem pole with a goat's head at the top of the pole and that particular uh, emblem or, or, or uh, the, the pole uh, is a symbol that's only used in the very highest levels of Satanism. So I was willing to testify. I, was, I went back to Philadelphia to testify that based on these drawings, these kids have been exposed to satanic activity. The judge wouldn't even let me in the courtroom. Wouldn't even let me in the courtroom. Lou's lost his kids. I talked to Lou just the other day. His, uh, one boy's 18 years old. He said that the kid called him the other day. He said he's scared. And, he, and Lou told him, he said, you can get out. You're old enough now. But uh, can he, you know? I mean, what's going to happen to him? Are they going to kill him? The lady that came to see me last night, they've tried to kill her. This is rampant. I have personally gone to the FBI. I've written them letters. I've begged them to conduct an investigation on this international trafficking of children. They came to interview me on a case one day. On the, uh, You remember that Larry Wayne Harris uh, anthrax scare in Las Vegas here several years ago? I have my own TV show. And I had just interviewed Larry Wayne Harris the night before he was arrested. He was arrested the next night. And um, so they sent, and they found out that I had interviewed him on, the, um, on my TV show. And they sent an agent, a female and a male agent, out to interview me. They didn't know who I was until they walked in, saw my FBI seal and all my letters of commendation, pictures of uh, presidents shaking hands with me. And uh, I said, uh, what are you here for? They said, we're, t we're here because we know you interviewed Larry Wayne Harris. That's right. Uh, I said, let's sit down. I'm going to turn this tape recorder on. Uh, we, 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 we really don't like tape recorders. We don't want to be taped. I said, well, if you're going to talk to me, you're going to be taped. I insisted. And uh, I taped the conversation. And at the end, I said, OK. And they, they asked me the questions. At the end, I said, OK, now it's my turn. I'm telling you about an organization in Washington, D.C., a CIA covert operation known as the Finders. I want you to investigate it. So I've got them on tape there. I've written them letters. And most recently, I, did, I learned about a CIA assassination team that was going to Central America and Mexico in uh, May and June to assassinate 400 um, civilians and Americans and uh, civilian natives and military personnel, everybody who had knowledge of the drug operation involving the Bushes and the Clintons, coming, bringing drugs into the United States. And uh, then when they got to assassinating those 400, they were going to come up here and assassinate some 100 Americans uh, in uh, uh, July and August. I wrote a letter May the 1st to the FBI, copy to Washington, D.C. And I told them I had this inside information that the CIA was going to send the assassination teams down there. And I want to put them on notice that this is going to take place and is happening. And uh, do you know what? In the interim, uh, May the 17th, USA Today, there was a little, a little squib 
in the USA article, in the newspaper, an article, and it said that a fellow named Sepulveda, an American from Puerto Rico, had been arrested with a cache of arms, camouflage uh, equipment, and bombs. Now, I subscribe to USA Today, okay. I received every issue up to the 16th, and I received every issue since the 18th, including the 18th. I did not receive the issue of the 17th that had that little squib in it. Don't you find that a coincidence? That shows how closely they're watching my mail, okay? But I had a friend of mine that called it to my attention. I immediately, immediately called the Attorney General's office in New Mexico, and I called the police department in Nuevo Laredo, Mexico, told them about the information I received about the CIA assassination squads going down there to murder those people. And what do you know? In the meantime, I learned about another individual, Robles, who was arrested in Mexico, Nuevo Laredo also, because I had a savage liaison with the chief of police down there. Robles was also an American with a cache of arms, guns and bombs. And it's interesting because those of you, by the way, who took down that um, email address, I put this in that report and uh, there were a number of uh, what I would consider secret keywords uh, that the chief passed on to me, uh, that, and, I, and telephone numbers that they took off of this Robles fellow. And I put it right in my report and sent it out. Uh, that report went out to initially to about uh, 400 people on the email. This email is beautiful, and I'm not a part of it because um, I'm a lone ranger, I'm a one-man army, I don't know how to operate, I don't have time. I was on the email at one time, and I, I was getting 150 letters a day, and I just couldn't keep up with it. So I had to, had to quit. But um, anyway, that went out to about 400 people, and uh, believe it or not, out of the 400, about a third of them came back and said, don't bother me with this, this trash. That shows um, uh, you know, how, how people care, how compassionate they are. And the others uh, copied it and sent it around. I'm on a radio show every Wednesday, as I mentioned, the Sam Solomon Show. And Sam, uh, Sa uh, Sam told me that, um, Stan, Stan told me, I sent it to him, one of the first ones. He said, in addition to the one that I sent him, he said he must have received 100 more from other people. So people are taking that report and sending it around the world. It's gone around the world quite a few times. Now, I have with me here USA Today. Again, another little article. June 29th, year 2000. By the way, this has been furnished to the Chief of Police in Nuevo Laredo, and as a result of my letter to the FBI telling them about this assassination squad, with a copy to Nuevo Laredo Chief Police, who notified the Attorney General's office in Mexico City, uh, an, uh, uh, an attorney from the Attorney General's office in Mexico City came to Las Vegas and spent the weekend with me. I briefed him on what's going on in the United States today. I gave him probably $1,500 worth of my research, by the way, on the table over there. Videotapes, reports, and so forth. I number of my own reports. Okay, here's June 29th, 2000. This is a third arrest. Americans arrested after taking the wrong turn. Two Americans were arrested in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, after authorities found 550,000 cartridges of ammunition worth $440,000 in their truck. Nancy Lee Anderson and her brother, Terry Lee Anderson, said they had no intention of going into Mexico. They said they had simply taken a wrong turn on the way to Montana from Arkansas. <laughs> now, I'm telling you, if that isn't CIA, nothing CIA. What civilians walk around or drive around in a truck with $440,000 worth of munitions, cartridges, and so forth? Um, I took it upon myself. I, I, one day I was thinking, I said, you know, we all have to do everything we can within our power, within our means, based on our training and experience, to do something about what's going on in the world today. And as a result of that, um, I decided in 1996 that I would run for President of the United States. Okay. Don't clap yet, because i got to tell you the end of the story, okay? <laughs> the 
So I figured, I'm saying to myself, let's see, I've been a Republican, basically, but in order to really get the word out, I think the thing I have to do is registered in the Democratic Party and then <clears throat> uh, go out and uh, try to become president through the Democratic primaries, which means I would go to the primary um, rallies and so forth. I got, okay, I got uh, 30 minutes to go. 40 now. 40, okay. And, 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 and um, I'm saying, well, look, I, I'll tell you what I'll do. I am saying to myself, I'm going to register in the Democratic Party so I can take Bill Clinton on head-to-head, toe-to-toe. He was the president, right? He was going to rerun. And uh, my idea was this. I would uh, register Democrat in the primary, go back to New Hampshire, the first series of voting, right? And uh, get on uh, the Sunday before the primary, Tuesday, I would run a copy of the Clinton Chronicles. <laughs> and in addition, and in addition, I would attend the rallies and uh, do whatever I could to expose this guy for what he is, phony sex maniac, uh, you know, no good SOB. Uh, th- those of you you know what the Clinton Chronicles is? It's a story about Bill Clinton's drug operation and his sexual escapades and all that sort of thing. It's a tremendous expose. He didn't inhale. Yeah, he didn't inhale, right. So anyway, so um, I had a fellow come forward and say that uh, he was going to get me some money. He said, look, I said, I can only take so much money um, by law. He says, no, I'm going to put you in a business deal. I'm going to bring some money up from overseas. I got this trust and all that. And I found out later he was a plant by the government, by the way. Uh, but anyway, I had all these promises, and I thought I was going to be able to do it. So I called the ABC affiliate, which is the only affiliate in uh, Manchester, the main uh, ABC affiliate there. And I, asked, I talked to Julie Capis, Capiano, I think is her name. And I asked her, I said, how much is it going to cost me to, uh, for a, a Sunday night show, prime time, 8 o'clock? Uh, she said, uh, $10,000 an hour. I said, okay, I need two, two hours. That would be $20,000. All right. Um, she said, call me back uh, next week, and I called her back next week, and I said, okay, I want more details on it. Um, she said, Mr. Gunnarsson, I'm sorry, but uh, I misquoted the price. Uh, the price is $120,000. So that just shows you the, the control of the press. Uh, anyway, I never made it to New Hampshire. didn't have enough money for a plane ticket, to be honest with you. But I did register. cost me $1,000, and I came in 11th out of 21 candidates without even appearing in the state. I registered in Texas. Now, I used to be in charge of the FBI in Dallas, Texas. And uh, that cost me 2,500 bucks. And I went down, campaigned for about three weeks, spent about uh, $5,500. Uh, fortunately, somebody else financed me. An old, uh, elder lady, elderly lady, I shouldn't be old. Elderly lady who had for- been a former state uh, senator herself in Texas, knew, uh, knew the ropes. Uh, Myra Dipple is the name out of Tyler. And I came in uh, fifth in the primary in Texas. Uh, I gathered over 15,500 votes. In fact, I did so well uh, on the Democratic ticket that the Republicans were talking about recruiting me coming over their side eventually. I'm just kidding, of course. <laughs> uh, but it was fun going to the rallies, and I would talk to these people. I got in line behind some guy one day. He's, I said, who are you going to vote for? He said, I'm voting for Billy. Billy? I said, why don't you vote for me? Well, who are you? And I said, well, uh, let's see, here's what I stand for. I stand for this, 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 and this. You know, all conservative approach to politics. He says, no, no, I'm voting for Billy. I'm not voting for you. And I, I said, well, let me give you this literature and read it. No, I don't want it. He wouldn't even read it. But anyway, it was kind of fun. Uh, and then I'd talk to these various individuals and try to explain, you know, what a phony Bill Clinton was. It's like, kind of like going into the enemy camp. Uh, but anyway, it was an experience. I came back, uh, re-registered independent in Nevada, ran for, the, uh, for Congress in Nevada, first uh, district. And I did all right there. I came in third out of five candidates, right behind the Republican and Democrat. Uh, but uh, the point is this. I'm saying I'm doing everything I can within my power to make a change. Now, I, I knew I wasn't going to be elected president of the United States, but I figured I've got to do it. I've got to do it. 
You know what it costs to register in the primary in every state in the United States? Over $100,000. Okay. Um, Colorado took my money just to be on the ballot, right? And they didn't put me on the ballot. They said, oh, that just gives you the privilege of having people do a write-in with your name. And then I talked to a precinct captain after the election. She said, we were given instructions not to put any of your information or your material on the table. Keep it under the table and only bring it out if people asked about you. Oregon and Tennessee would not put me on the ballot even though it didn't cost anything because I was not a viable candidate. I wrote to both of them and I said, hey, wait a minute, I've been on every radio talk show in America, Larry King, hard copy, inside edition, 48 hours, 2020, uh, and I'm not a viable, and I'm former head of the FBI, and so on and so on, and I'm not a viable candidate? That's right, you're not a viable candidate. So it's a, it's a rich man's game, and the only way you're gonna do it, make it, is uh, to belong to the club, and the club is the Illuminati, let's face it. Now in a skull and bone. Now here's another problem we have. There are electronic voting machines out there. The electronic, by the way, all this information is in this book, this documentation I'm, what I have here. These electronic voting machines, uh, there's no paper trail. They can be manipulated. They can be fixed. There was a candidate in uh, New Orleans uh, who lost. And she went in the next day with the video camera and uh, with the machines and voted for herself on, a, on the same machine uh, dozens of times. And every third vote, when she voted for herself, went to her opponent. Is that what happened to John McCain? Uh, I don't know about McCain, but John DeCamp in Nebraska? John McCain during the primary? I don't know about that. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, but in, uh, in Nebraska? John DeCamp ran for governor, my good friend, uh, the gentleman behind the Franklin cover-up who's trying to expose it, a case I mentioned a few moments ago. Uh, he was um, out of five candidates in the primary, Republican primary, he was leading a week before by the polls with 36 percent. And um, when the vote came in, he came in third with 14 percent of the vote. Not only in one location, but every location across the state. What this is, they're arrogant. They're saying to John DeCant, hey, we control it. You get 14% in every precinct, and that's all you're going to get. Now, on the, Nebra on the, uh, Franklin on the McDonald case, uh, let me mention this also. There were some satanic signs left in the house. Did I? I don't think I covered this, did I? There was a headless, there was a headless doll. No, excuse me, there was a doll's head. There were um, unexplained feathers. Um, there was, um, there were ten shallow ice pick wounds in the two and a half year old's chest in the form of an S. I asked Alina what that stood for and she said it stood for Satan. So, uh, these people, um, are, um, as I said, they're arrogant. They're, uh, letting us know they're around. There's subliminal messages every day. You can walk down the street, drive, watch TV, look at the magazine. I see subliminal messages constantly. How many times have you seen the Illuminati diamond? Yeah. Every, you see it every place, the triangle. You see it. And I'll tell you something else. You look at the Republican and the Democratic logo, you know the three stars at the top? Well, at one time, the star was, the point was at the top, now it's been inverted, the goat's head. Stars at the bottom with the two stars like this the Democratic and the Republican logos. Look at it next time. That's how strong they are. The press, I blame a lot of this on the press. Oh, by the way, I had my own, I, I started to mention, I had my own radio show. Another step by me to try to do the maximum, whatever I could do. Uh, I had a show for about two years. It was two hours, uh, five days a week. And I would pull in uh, some ex-FBI informants, uh, some um, ex-CIA guys, black ops. Chip Tatum is an example. Uh, another one was uh, Darlene Novinger. Novinger uh, was able to develop information that put George and Neb uh, and uh, Jeb Bush into the drug operation. Uh, she developed this information as an FBI informant. Uh, came back to Harrisburg, her uh, main uh, place of operation. 
talked to the Harrisburg FBI agents, and uh, they set her down for seven and a half hours, said she's hallucinating, she's lying, and uh, she did not break. She st stuck with her story. Uh, later, her, um, her husband disappeared. His body was found in the river in uh, Harrison, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Only it wasn't his body, it was somebody else's body, but it has his identification on it. Her father, uh, she received a phone call two weeks before her father died from a woman named Holiday in the state of Washington who told her that your father's going to die in two weeks. Now, this is the way they operate. Um, so I blame the, um, oh, my radio talk show was great. I had a lot of fun. Um, I developed all kinds of information. Um, I have the, Chip Tatum was one of my uh, uh, guests. A chip is now in hiding in an island in Central America. Um, he went public, uh, uh, became a whistleblower, and uh, as you know that the CIA didn't like that at all, and uh, they were getting ready to go after him, and uh, he was a fugitive right now today, uh, living uh, in this uh, low particular location. I can get to him if I have to. Um, I, 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 I don't even try because I'm covered like a blanket. Um, I'm being watched constantly. I went to Philadelphia May the 3rd to the 10th of this year, and while I was gone, I have a condominium on third floor, uh, I was burglarized, no forced entry. They took a number of my files and some of my sensitive information. Um, I had uh, information there about the Oklahoma City bombing. I personally made two trips to Oklahoma, by the way, and investigated it myself. I got my own bombing report over there. The truck bomb was not a fertilizer bomb. It was a barometric bomb, electrohydrodynamic gaseous fuel device. Uh, it's a, it was a bomb that at the time was only known uh, to 10 people how to assemble it. McVeigh wasn't one of them. I happen to know that there were at least 11 other people besides McVeigh and Nichols involved in the bombing. Uh, there was a fellow named Terrence Yegi, a police officer, black man, six foot four, 275 pound, powerful man. He was a, a, a buff, a video buff. He was a block from the uh, building when it blew up. Uh, Terrence got his video camera out immediately, went over and he saw FBI agents and BATF agents coming out of the surrounding buildings with their jackets on that said BATF and FBI. What's BATF? Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. ATF, in other words. Um, it, he, he started investigating the case himself like I did, and uh, all of a sudden he's contacted by a group of uh, prosecutors, quote unquote, quote, tries, uh, five states prosecuting task force. And uh, they talked to him, they talked to his uh, wife. Um, he was to meet them uh, at 9.30 uh, uh, outside of Oklahoma City at a smaller community. They found his body at 1.30. Uh, there was uh, blood throughout his car. Somebody had disassembled the seats, taken them out. Um, he had um, lacerations. Uh, around his ankles and wrists. He had handcuffs, he had handcuffs on. Uh, he was stabbed in the juggler vein here and in the juggler vein here. And he had 11 stab, 11 cut marks up both arms, total of 13, which is satanic cult. And um, he was found a mile and a half uh, over into a cornfield someplace, uh, shot himself and uh, it was, uh, he was suicided. <laughs> we call it Arkansided, actually. It was, he was suicided. They said it was a suicide. They wanted to get their hands on that videotape. And they don't think they did. I don't know where it is. But uh, there were more people involved in that than McVeigh and Nichols. Um, McVeigh was a patsy, uh, as my friend back here mentioned it. Uh, this uh, bombing was, uh, the purpose was to pass the anti-terrorism legislation. Um, I gave a speech in Palm Springs uh, let's see, this was uh, April the uh, 19th, and I think it was May the 3rd. Uh, and um, there was the national press was there because Mark Cornkey from Michigan was the main speaker. And when I accepted the speech, I didn't know Cornkey was going to be there. They said, well, you give a speech? And I said, sure, I'll give a speech to anybody. And uh, so I went down there, and I found out Cornkey was the main speaker, which was fine. But in my, they had Time Magazine, everybody else there, uh, main, mainstream. And in my speech, I said that this was, an act by a demonic element within the government that wanted the anti-terrorism legislation passed. And I was right. I was right on target. Now, this anti-terrorism legislation in America was written under the Bush administration 
and one of the authors is a female Department of Justice attorney. She made the statement publicly before this publishes, before this passes, people will have to be killed. This was back in the 80s. Along comes the World Trade Center, 1993. New York Times, October 28, 1993. Um, you get a, I got a copy of it in here, by the way. Um, it states that the FBI had an informant, Salam, uh, who was in with the terrorist group involved in the terrorist attack itself. Salam told the FBI in advance about the uh, bombing. And the FBI not only knew in advance, they furnished the ingredients for the bomb. But there were only six people killed there. A million dollars, a thousand people injured and a half a million dollars in damage. Not enough people killed to pass the anti-terrorism. Two years later, 168, there were enough. I have a, a video back here, Oklahoma City cover-up. It's the um, TV uh, sh uh, that was shown the afternoon of the bombing in Oklahoma City. And the announcer uh, says, um, hey, they found an unexploded bomb, and it shows people running from the building. And then a little while later, uh, they said, the announcer says, they found another unexploded bomb. This time we're going to find out who did this because it has U.S. Army written on it. Now, this is right on TV, <laughs> right? These, the true facts will usually be stated within a day or a day and a half after the incident. Afterward, after that, then they start spinning it, right, and changing it. Like I said today, the uh, satanic uh, aspect of it on these school shootings. Um, this is right there. I mean, it cannot be refuted. There were, as I said, there were 11 other people involved in the bombing. The government knew about it. A girl named Carol Howe uh, was an ATF informant. She told the ATF about it in advance. In fact, she helped case the building uh, with some of the terrorists. There was a fellow named Kerry Gagan in Denver, Colorado who was an FBI informant out of Mexico City, uh, working with the uh, Iranians. He told the FBI about the bombing in advance. And what did they do with Carol Howe and uh, with Kerry Gay, you want to guess? They prosecuted him. They tried to put him in jail because they didn't want him talking. What happened a year after the uh, bombing? The anti-terrorism passed. It took away our constitutional rights in the way of indiscriminate wiretaps. Um, the president can designate a group as a terrorist group uh, and say they cannot earn any money. Uh, it, it allowed the CIA to operate internally. Before that, they couldn't operate in the United States. And it goes on and on and on. Now, one, more, I wanna, uh, one other point I want to make, and then we'll take questions. And that is the great American news media, the mainstream media. Um, I have an article in here, in this book, and it's, um, it's not an article, it's part of the congressional record, February 9, 1917. And a Congressman Calloway makes a statement in there that in 1915, the J.P. Morgan interests bought up 25 of America's leading newspapers for the purpose of controlling the news in the United States, inserted their own editors, and thereafter began a campaign to control the mainstream media and information that went to the American people. This was 85 years ago, folks. What do you think they've done since then? Look at Peter Jennings and Dan Rather and, Paul and Brokaw. Brokaw, by the way, is from Omaha. And he's a very close friend of Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett, one of the richest men in America, has been identified by the kids in Omaha, by the way. Um, so there you go. Uh, mainstream media, they've got them in their hip pocket. People Magazine on my McMartin case. People Magazine did an article on the tunnels, the fact that we found tunnels. They interviewed uh, Gary Stickle, the archaeologist, and they, we gave him all the documentation. I have the documentation in this book here also. And you know what? They came right out in their magazine and said they didn't find any tunnels in the tunnel dig. So, uh, any more? Should we take questions? How much time do we have? We have another 23 minutes for questions. Anybody want to ask any questions? Yes. Huh? <laughs> it's interesting that uh, the head of the KGB over in uh, Russia is now president there, and uh, the um, son of the former FBI, uh, CIA director in the United States is going to be president here. 
And uh, my understanding, I heard this, and I'd like your take on it, is that they picked Dick Cheney because he's uh, six, 63 years old or something. He'll be 71 in eight years. And he certainly won't run for president at that time. Uh, and so that'll lay the groundwork for, guess who? Hillary. Jeb. Oh, Jeb? OK. <laughs> it doesn't surprise me. Um, uh, my informant, um, um, actually, ex-FBI informant, um, uh, um, Darlene Novinger has put Jeb and George Bush into the drug operation. Uh, Jeb along with George Sr. Another question there? I'm curious about a couple of things. I can't remember the details even, and that shows how much our press had control. Over a case um, about probably 10 years ago in Saskatoon, near, near Saskatoon, does anyone here remember that? Martinsville. Did you ever hear about that? No, Several children as well, and, and um, I don't know, I'm struggling anyway, just, just so people wonder about that too. And, and there was claims by the children there, all of them, of satanic Oh, problems. it's very common. There are, um, I'd estimate, a little under 4 million practicing Satanists in America. And I came across this, it's a projected figure. Um, I have an informant in the South Bay area of uh, Los Angeles. Population 200,000, an informant told me there are probably 3,000 practicing Satanists there. Lincoln, Nebraska, population 200,000. Another informant, separate, said she thought that there were about 3,000 there. Iowa City, Iowa, population 100,000. Third informant, not known to the other informant, said there's 1,500. So if you take that figure and project it, it's 1.5% of the population. <coughs> Excuse me, and um, that's a little, little under 4 million people in the United States that are involved in this sort of thing. That's heavy, but that's what I come up with. Okay, yeah. I, as a Canadian, I really want to fool myself that this isn't happening here. <laughs> oh, no, it's uh, very common. Victoria is very heavily concentrated with satanic activity. In fact, the lady that I'm going to meet with her uh, Tuesday, the, the case we're going to discuss is out of Victoria. Um, I might mention also that uh, three separate sources on the number of human sacrifices, uh, between 50 and 60,000 a year. And we're talking now, you know, Ken Lanning is the behavioral science expert in Quantico, Virginia, for the FBI. And um, even though I've furnished him and the FBI documents and upon document of uh, information, uh, he says that there's no organized satanic movement, it's only dabblers. And on the McMartin case, uh, one of the best finds we had in the way of an artifact was uh, the kid said there was a tunnel uh, next to the west room. It was a, a school room. And we went down with a, a backhoe right straight down about 15 feet, uh, right next to the wall where the kid said there was a tunnel. This has been filled in now. And there was a plastic bag there, half sticking out and half under the, uh, the beam, the support, house support. We pulled it out, it was a Disney bag, and it was uh, copyright 1982, which gives us a time frame of 1982 or 83 when they filled in the tunnels. And the case broke in 1982, by the way. They went out there and filled those tunnels. Yes, ma'am. Then is the John Bonet case connected with all of this, too? Because I, I have no documentation that it is. Based on the circumstances, I believe it is. There are ligatures on the child's neck. Uh, that's one of the signs, by the way. Uh, and in the mind control program, look at yours, there's bruises. Uh, and in the mind control program, what they do, they take, take them right up to the edge of death and bring them back. That's one of the tortures. And I suspect they took her right up the edge of death and couldn't bring her back. They went a little too far. Are you familiar with Linda Thompson? I know of her, huh? All right. Do you know if she's still alive or anything like that? Because I know she puts out a lot of same materials that you are and take the same stand, although she's not with the FBI. She's a lawyer out of uh, Indianapolis area. I don't know what's happened to her. I've, I haven't heard from her in several years. Yeah, I haven't heard from her in three years. I just wonder if you knew. Um, Phil Schneider, do you, are you familiar with that name? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you know what exactly happened with him, and is he credible from the tapes that he did on the tunneling under Area 51 and uh, some of the other areas in the United States? I, I don't know. Um, if he's credible, I know of his work. Um, I've heard a lot of stories about um, tunnels and cities, underground cities. I've also heard a lot of stories about internment camps. 
there is a new federal uh, execution center in Terre Haute, Indiana. It houses, I think, 52 people. We haven't had a federal execution since 1962. I was reading some material the other day about an internment camp in, um, in um, Alaska. It's supposed to house a million people. Um, uh, getting back to the underground cities and the tunnels, um, I would say there's good possibility of it, of it but you know, I, proven it's something else. I, you read these things, proven it is another thing. Yeah, I know that Phil had said that he was about to uh, expose it. He had mapped them all out, and two, two months before the book was to be released, he was killed. Oh, he uh, committed suicide, I assume. Yeah, they, they, somebody suicided him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the, uh, the, in the Waco case, the key witness for the, the uh, families uh, was murdered just before he was to testify. He, he was an infrared specialist, expert, and he uh, had already given depositions, as I recall, he'd given depositions, that the infrared um, analysis of the, um, of the films of the Waco incident showed that the government did fire into the compound. And that's what Lyndon Thompson he just finished exposing that, as well as the, uh, the containment camps, uh, the concentration camps. And it was shortly after that uh, we never heard from her again. So, um, Yeah, they're sneaky. And there's a lot of people that have disappeared. Um, I'm, I can tell you this, on one of the internment camps, um, 1997, I had uh, dinner with um, an individual who had formerly been the civilian member of the um, prison board in the state of Texas. It's a high political position. And he told me that in Texas they have eight brand new prisons that are manned with no inmates. So I can guarantee that that's a true story. And you know, there's no reason for him to tell me otherwise. Yes. Hi there. Um, as you know, I have a two and a half year old daughter. You actually met her at a beautiful lunch. beautiful child, like and her mother. Thank you. <laughs> And um, I live in one of the, in the third largest city in Canada. What are some of the practical things that we can do to safeguard our own children? Because nobody wants this to happen to their own child. Um, with your experience, do you have any practical pointers, things to look for, things that we can identify as parents to keep our own children safe and to inform other parents? Uh, are you a working mother? Um, no, thankfully I'm not. Well, then you're in good shape. Um, I recommend that, uh, that the mothers be the mothers. That's one of the problems in the world today. There's too many mothers are leaving their children with somebody else. Uh, the, the preschools uh, are a breeding ground for the satanic activity in many instances. Uh, the Virginia McMartin in the Mc, McMartin case has traveled all over the world setting up preschools. Dr. Uh, Roland Summit, uh, former uh, psychiatrist UCLA Harbor Hospital, who's been involved in these issues, told me that uh, there are 50 other preschools around the country where the kids talked about tunnels under the school. So the main thing as I see it with your children is to watch your children like a hawk. Don't let them out of your sight. I've known of kids who were kidnapped in grocery stores when their parents were shopping in the grocery store. The kids go around the corner, they never see them again. Uh, I know a mother who was shopping in the grocery store and she looked up and this man was carrying her child out the front door. And she ran out and grabbed the kid and the guy went on and laughed. Uh, so I think the main thing is to, you know, watch your child like a hawk. Don't, don't turn your child over to anybody else. Uh, and, if, you know, if you do have to have a babysitter, make sure you know the babysitter. Um, one of the things that they did uh, with the kids in the McMartin case is they would tell these little, little two, three, four-year-old kids in front, after they would burn the babies or sacrifice the babies or cut them up, we're going to do this to your brother, your sister, your mother, your daddy if you talk. And the one little girl, they took her home, molested her in her own bedroom, left a memento there, took her cat, came back, and sacrificed the cat in front of her and the other kids. Now you think that, that's why the big issue is, well, why don't the children talk? Why don't the children, they don't dare talk. They're scared to death. Um, main thing is just watch your child closely. That's all I mean. Now I have a, uh, uh, a list, if, if you are suspect, of your child being molested, or if you do have your kid in a preschool and you think there's a problem, I have a whole checkoff list of things to look for, like blood in the diaper, uh, change of personality, the child has an unusual interest in her genitals, his or her genitals, that sort of thing. That's a, that's a list of about three or four pages long. And if somebody wants to drop me a note, uh, I didn't bring it with me, I'll be glad to furnish it to them. Uh, 
By the way, while I'm thinking about it, I've got um, this is uh, I've got some fantastic research over there. I've got some great videos. Um, normally, those videos sell for like twenty-three dollars in the states. If anybody wants them, um, I just do not take them back with me. I'd like to leave them here in Canada, to be honest with you. I'll give them to you for twenty bucks each, which is about twelve dollars uh, U.S. Um, anything on that table except the, uh, the Bryce Taylor, uh, you can have that for 20 bucks flat across the board. Um, I have an article here that I meant to say something about during the lecture. It was in the recent National Enquirer. It's about all the people that have been killed, murdered, suicided, or suspiciously uh, dead from the Clinton administration. The number's up to 45 people. And I thought it was higher than that, but, you know. Since he's been president? That's since he's been president, including the two little boys in Arkansas who they said uh, committed suicide. Teenagers Kevin Ives and uh, Don Henry were run over and killed by a train in rural Arkansas after they supposedly fell asleep on the tracks in a marijuana-induced stupor. Ives' mother, however, says the boys witnessed drug drops linked to Clinton pals, and a forensic expert concluded they were murdered. The next four victims are teens who allegedly knew too much about what Ives and Henry had witnessed. They went out one night camping, these two little boys, I think they're 11 to 12 years old, and they ran into a drug drop uh, 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 that ties back into Clinton and his boys. <coughs> a, a plane was coming in and they dropped some packages and they were stabbed in the back and then they were placed on the railroad tracks and uh, tried to make it look like suicide. They were murdered, covered up by the Clinton administration. One of the saddest stories here on the Clinton uh, situation, there's a little girl named Mary Mahoney who was an intern and who was um, approached by, um, uh, Clinton put a move on her. She was a little 21-year-old girl. And uh, she uh, quit the White House for that reason, and went over and got a job in Georgetown working for Starbucks. And uh, uh, Chelsea came in there one night and ordered, and saw her, said hello to her, and ordered a cup of coffee. Two weeks later, uh, some gunmen came in and killed her and two other people in Starbucks. Shot them, no robbery, just murdered them. This man is a brutal, evil uh, psychopath. And oh, so are his buddies. Yes, question. What approach, if any, might we be taking to speak to our own children about these issues, or do we simply risk losing our children by talking to them about it? Oh, boy, that's a tough one. Um, are we any psychiatrists here? <laughs> I, uh, I think that's a... That's a call you have to make. Uh, I don't think it hurts to educate your kids and to scare the hell out of them about this is what's going on here. What usually happens in the satanic movement, these kids are, are um, multi-generation. The mothers and fathers, the grandmothers, grandfathers uh, are part of the movement. And um, like Kathy O'Brien and Bryce Taylor, and I have a book about, by Bryce over here, Thanks for the Memories, um, they were born into the movement. And uh, so uh, uh, the problem that you have is your kids now, if you're not multi-generation yourself, or your parent, or your grand, your parents, your, their grandparents, the problem you have is them being recruited now, you know, when they get into junior high and high school. Um, I think a good solid base is a good Christian uh, background. Uh, and talk to your kids about what's right and what's wrong. Uh, educate them on this. Sure, I'd let them know about what they can expect, because if there's any indication at all or inclination that they have that they might be recruited, they will come after them. Uh, what they usually do is they start with uh, uh, little parties, and they'll bring out a little marijuana. If the kid doesn't object to that, they go on to something harder, and then they go on to something harder. And they usually observe these kids for about two years before they try to recruit them. Uh, it's a long process because they don't want anybody coming in who's going to you know, be an informant against them or against their interests. I'd give them, tell your kids about it. I'd educate them. Yeah. The uh, evidence is overwhelming about what you're saying in regard to the Clinton administration. As you said, the um, Clinton Chronicles, the rise of Bill Clinton, the book by the British author, uh, The Secret Life of Bill Clinton, etc., etc. Uh, the evidence is overwhelming, and yet, yet you get people like Lyndon LaRouche who are uh, Clinton apologists. Uh, is he an agent provocateur, or what do you know about Lyndon LaRouche? Uh, Lyndon LaRouche, I know Lyndon LaRouche very well. In fact, I was on the, quote, campaign trail with him. Uh, he was at some of the primaries, okay. uh, events that I was at. Uh, you have to look back at what happened to Lyndon. Lyndon was arrested and put in jail, right? Uh, he got out. 
I think he got out early. So do you think he made a deal with somebody to get out early? I don't know. Okay, we're on the same wavelength. Okay. Now, he is uh, he's a critic. He's on the Democratic primary. He's a critic of, uh, of the Bushes, but he never criticizes Bill Clinton. I think it was the movie Men in Black that said, if you want to know what's really going on, read the National Enquirer. And so from the, ever since then, when I go to the, to the grocery store, I really kind of check out what they've got on their headlines. Did you it see just, this article? No. Yeah. I, I just wondered if you have a comment about that. About the National Enquirer? Just well, there's good and bad in every, most, almost every. There's more bad in the mainstream media than there is in the National Enquirer, as far as I'm concerned. They slant it, cut it, change it. Um, I've been described in uh, Vanity Fair as a brash braggadocian uh, in an article they did on the McDonald case. And the author of that uh, article was a fellow named Sam Anson. Sam Anson? Okay. That's kind of interesting. I looked at that and I said, Sam Anson. Now that name, that sounds familiar. The son of Sam Murders in New York. And he's from New York, by the way. Now that doesn't mean he's involved in it, but uh, that's one of your probably, in my opinion, it's probably one of these uh, subliminal messages of some sort. But anyway, he called me a brash braggadocian. The New York Times uh, told me that I was a, um, or said in the front page of an article they did about me before Y2K that I was uh, one of the national leaders of uh, uh, the, um, some, some, some movement. Uh, I don't know if it wasn't terrorists, it was the uh, um, whatever in the country. So they, they described me in all kinds of terms. Not complimentary, why, by the way, not at all. Uh, so, but, yeah, I, 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 I get it and read it, and I'll tell you another ma magazine that I really like, that I highly recommend, is the, uh, the Spotlight. The Spotlight tells it like it is, it's right out there. And as a matter of fact, uh, they've asked me to be a West Coast representative, and if I, you know, if there's any stories come up on the West Coast, they've asked me if I check into it. And I do it for free. But, um, Go ahead. Sorry, I just have a comment for parents about an article that I read about the children that are looked for, and they looked for obedient children, children that do as they're told without question. So precocious children are safer. Right. <laughs> Hi, Ted. Where I come from in South Africa, we have approximately 25,000 children disappearing every year. There's been a huge um, investigation into where these children are disappearing, and they have found the children leaving in airplanes uh, out to Europe. Uh, these are street urchins and children that have been given five bucks and told they're going on a trip overseas, and their parents actually say, that's great, and they're going to get uplifted and things like that, and they're going to get an education overseas, and they're going into sex slavery and Satanism. There's been a lot of uh, evidence of ritual killings. They found one burial ground where 15 children were buried un uh, under a bridge. Um, what happened, the, the police there put on a concerted effort to, to investigate these, these deaths and, and things that were happening. But they overzealously went on a witch hunt and anybody that was into any kind of alternative thinking was all of a sudden branded as a Satanist. And the police were going around from school to school giving talks and asking children to snitch on each other and go to the headmaster so they could draw up a list. Just because my father was a homeopath, I was all of a sudden a Satanist. They came to my, our house and they, under the Security Act, pulled the house apart trying to look for satanic articles and things like that. Subsequently, we found the head of the department researching this was a Satanist himself. Well, yeah, uh, um, they've infiltrated. This stuff tells into the Illuminati, um, the drug operation, pornography. And still to this day, um, I practice alternative medicine in South Africa and still have branded a Satanist because of a very closed-mindedness. And I just want to know where they draw the line where Satanism actually starts and ends because people who are generally free thinkers who use natural products, for instance, can be labeled as such as well. Well, I, I've been told uh, by people inside the cults and at high levels that the communists have infiltrated the cult drug network in this country today. And this is all part of the communist movement to take over from within. And um, I, I have no reason to, to believe it isn't true. There's another thing I would like to express that I've, I've noticed when I've been up here in the Starbucks stores where all the kids are hanging out. 
If you look on the fancy murals they've got on their walls, every single wall in every Starbucks store has the pyramid with the eye bleeding into a chalice, a satanic cup. Yeah, I, I noticed that, that too. I've noticed that also. You'll see that uh, Illuminati pyramid uh, almost every day. Yeah. Thank you. No, go ahead. Yeah, you got a few more minutes. You had uh, mentioned a number of other people that were um, relaying information onto you, and, and some of them had been uh, killed. What, uh, and I, we're all obviously thankful that you haven't been uh, been killed, but what has accounted for your alive? safety? Yeah, why am I alive? Um, I'm alive for several reasons. Uh, the last time anybody attempted to do anything to me was in Nebraska. Um, I uh, was in John DeCamp's office. I called uh, Omaha, five, 50 miles away. Uh, to arrange to meet somebody at the Bohemian restaurant. Um, and I met that person at 12 noon. And then he and I went out and uh, did some work. It was on the Johnny Gosh kidnapping case. I came back at 3 o'clock. I left uh, at 3 o'clock, drove back to Lincoln at 3.30. I was doing 75 miles an hour down the freeway, and my right front wheel came off. And um, they had loosened the lug nuts on my wheels. Uh, that was the last time. Um, I've, I've made it very clear. First of all, back in the early 80s, when I uh, had this problem, the security problem with gunmen in 1982, um, I uh, uh, had uh, developed a lot of information about homicides that had taken place in the United States by the cults. And I had information about 18 homicides uh, and um, who committed them, where the bodies were, if there were bodies or uh, otherwise, the details of the homicides. And I put those in an envelope, uh, and I was ready to mail them out to a dozen people if anything happened to me or anybody in my family. That's number one. Number two, um, I had lunch with the fellow about that time in order to get the, the cult hit off of Florida and Houston out, uh, off of me. That would have been 83. And um, I knew that he was tied into the network, and I had said, let's go have lunch. I went and had lunch with him. I told him, I said, if anything happens to me, or any members of my family, there will be retaliation. I think you should be aware of that. And uh, I've, I've arranged for retaliation in a dozen instances. Uh, not the dirt bags that are coming after me. The, the, the people in the surveillances are sitting half a block away. They quit, by the way. When I start chasing them out of the neighborhood, they quit running those surveillances on me, those permanent surveillances on me. But I do get a moving surveillance once in a while. And then I, I turn around and go after them. They think I'm crazy. They might be right, OK? <laughs> Let them think I'm crazy. Uh, and they think I'm paranoid, they are right about that. But a little paranoia is uh, good, you know, it makes you safe. Um, but in addition to that, um, uh, I've arranged for retaliation and uh, I've, I've had a lot of publicity. I've made a lot of newspapers, like the front page of the LA Times. I've been in People Magazine here recently. Um, and I've been, um, on a lot of TV shows and radio talk shows, I have my own show and on Steve, Stan Solomon's show and all that. So if they do anything to me, it'd be counterproductive. It'd just give me credibility. Um, and I don't think they want to mess with me or my family. They really shouldn't. It'd be very dangerous for some of them. A few quick questions. And uh, the second one, I think, is maybe it's rhetorical, but if you were able to round up these people that were committing these, uh, these crimes, uh, Clintons and members of the Illuminati and stuff like that, what do you think would be an exact punishment for their crimes? I think you have to uh, consider the, the facts and the evidence to be gathered before you can make a conclusion as to what should be found. They should, anybody involved in murder, as far as I'm concerned, they should be public, uh, executed themselves. I mean, they, you know. Yeah, oh yeah. These people are animals. They're evil, evil people. You mentioned earlier that you're, uh, you considered yourself a Lone Ranger. Have you um, been looking for a Tonto? No, I don't, I don't even trust Tonto. Okay. <laughs> I'm a Lone Ranger without Tonto. <laughs> I have a National Enquirer type question. Everyone's afraid to ask it. You might not want to answer this, and if you don't want to, it's fine. But uh, can you bring us up to speed on the Art Bell thing? A lot of us are wit uh, witnesses or <laughs> listeners of Art Bell. And I'd really like to know, I, you don't have to say a whole bunch, but I would really like to know. Yeah. If you think that, like, he never says nothing about Bill Clinton either, you know, never. And I wonder if you think maybe those guys in the black suits got to him. <laughs> you know, I don't mind you asking that question. Okay. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you the uh, information right out of the court records. But I can't say any more than that. 
Uh, I guess you're all aware that Art Bell suing me for millions of dollars. Are you aware of that? No, who's Art Bell? Uh, he's a radio talk show host down in uh, Pahrump, Nevada. He was on five hours a night, six nights a week. Uh, he's heavy into the UFOs and Area 51 and all that sort of thing. And uh, when I had my radio talk show on December the 9th, 1997, I had a fellow named Dave Hinkson on my show. And we're talking about, Dave Hinkson has a series of uh, health products, colloidal silver and zinc and plutonium and all that sort of thing. And, um, and we're talking about that, and all of a sudden Dave comes out and starts talking about, well, uh, I have information about uh, Art Bell. I said, yeah, well, what's, what's that? He, he said, he started making some disparaging remarks about Art Bell being accused of uh, something and then covering it up and, and being able to pay his way out of it. And he asked me my advice on what he should do. And I said, well, I'd go court check the court records. And uh, that's about all that I said. Uh, I didn't accuse him of anything. And um, then we went on to, um, to another topic. A woman from West Virginia called on the show. And I said, yes, Ruth. Her name was Ruth. And uh, that was it. But the fellow did infer that Art Bell was involved uh, in some sort of a sexual um, problem with uh, a juvenile. Well, um, next thing I know, I'm being sued. Uh, Dave Hankson is being sued. And the radio station, Nashville, Tennessee, WWCR, is being sued. Radio WWCR is one of the largest um, shortwave stations in the world. They have, I think, 100,000 watt operations there. Uh, so, um, Art Bell's attorney goes on Good Morning America, and Art Bell himself has m made many times a statement that I accused him of being a child molester. I've never accused him of being a child molester. That's absolutely not true. I never made that statement about him. Uh, he's misquoting me, and uh, when we get in the courtroom, and um, uh, you know, that'll all come out. I can say right now that what he said about me is not true, and I have never said anything unkind about him at all, to be honest with you. As a matter of fact, about a year before um, my show, somebody called in on my show and asked about Art Bell. I said, I think he's doing a good job. He's helping to wake up America. Um, now, uh, do any of you know Kirk Billings? Yeah. Okay, Kirk Billings all of a sudden comes up with a, a memo. We, have, we call for summary judgment get me out of the case. And uh, the day before uh, we go for oral arguments on the summary judgment, Kurt Billings and his wife file papers. And uh, in this memo, and I can tell you this because this is in the court record, uh, file papers claiming uh, that uh, he talked to me last November in Las Vegas. And he did uh, talk to me, by the way. And he did ask me about the case. And I told him I couldn't discuss it because it's in litigation. But in his memo, uh, he said that I said that I had pictures of Art Bell Sr. involved in sexual pleasure with uh, um, animals and other things in uh, a cave in Colorado. And then I said I had him in New Mexico. And then I admitted that I didn't have any pictures. Well, that was, that's not right lie. I never said that. And then in addition, there's a guy named uh, Gray Wolf. Has anybody heard of a fellow named Gray Wolf? He's down in Washington State. He came in with a memo about the day before also. And he said that he, he talked to me in an exposition in February 1997, which would have been eight or nine months before the Art Bell show, I mean, my show with uh, Dave Inkson. And, uh, and then I said I was going to get Art Bell. He's no effing American and all that. I don't use that word, by the way. Uh, Art Bell is no effing American, and I'm going to get him, and this and that. These are all outright lies. And uh, I'm just basically just rocking along. Keep my mouth shut, not making any statement to one way or the other. By the way, we lost the summary judgment. The judge ruled that we didn't have to go to trial. And I shouldn't be in any trial. But, uh, you know, it costs a lot of money. That's why I'm offering you those videotapes cheap, so I can pay my attorney bill. Yes? Uh, one thing I just want to oh, I'll suck her. One thing I want to uh, mention to you, Ted, is that uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm very appreciative of uh, uh, people like yourself and Eustace coming up here because I do look up to you guys. Uh, I'm a newbie in this uh, 
in this field. And uh, watching you and listening to your experiences, listening to Eustace's experiences, Kathy's experiences, gives me hope that uh, I'm going to live to a ripe old age and I'm not uh, setting up my own uh, death right now by the age of 40 because I think uh, I, I'm hoping, having a little more hope than, uh, than uh, most people have for me right now. <laughs> uh, you're doing a great job as far as, you know, from our conversation we had today. Yeah. And uh, you know, just keep up the good work. Uh, I, I agree with Kathy and Eustace. I think this thing's turning around. I, I think, think so we're too. making progress. And you know, I've been in the fight for 20 years, ever since the McDonald case in 1980. And I'm more excited and enthused about it than you can imagine, uh, in spite of the fact that, you know, they're burglarizing my place and running surveillances on me and um, taking, loosen the lug nuts on my wheels. Uh, by the way, one of the things that they did uh, is they came in my place in the middle of the night and put a penny at my, the foot of my bed uh, just to let me know that I'm available. They can get to me anytime. They're trying to intimidate me. You know? I'm not really intimidatable, you know. I'm really not, I, because, you know, if I ever catch them in my house, I'll blow them away. Well, one of, one of the, uh, I think a lot of, the big question that everybody always has in their mind is the ultimate question of why all this happens. And I've given that a lot of thought over the last year. And one of the um, answers that I've come up with, and I think this is hitting almost close to home, but I'm not sure quite there yet. Have you heard of the Royal Institute of International Affairs? Yes. Okay. I understand that George Bush is actually a member of the RIIA, which is run by the Queen of England. And as far as I understand, everything stems from the RI, RIIA, which is where George Bush and uh, everybody else connected with the presidency and in this organization takes their orders from. Everybody who's involved with satanic cults and the Masonic rituals takes their orders from the I, RIAA or RIIA. And that's where it all stems from, is, is actually the uh, city of London. I agree and, with that. And which is supposed to be the new, the new Troy. I agree with that. And I agree with that. If, it ties what, into the Bilderbergs. Yeah. And uh, there was uh, the Bilderbergs, uh, not the Bilderbergs per se had a meeting, but a group of the, Bilder, uh, the Illuminati. A group of the Illuminati had a meeting here a year or so ago, secret meeting. And you know, the, the mainstream newspapers didn't even print it, but there's a little old newspaper in, in uh, Pickett, someplace in Mississippi, I've got the article in here, that printed it, and it described them as Illuminati members. And uh, it's all, you know, it, it has the big ribbon that ties in. And anybody, like I think you were mentioning, uh, when you consider what Kathy says, what Eustace says, what I say, and some of these other uh, speakers, it all kind of ties together, doesn't it? We all have different experiences. Because I can't, you know, when I, I have a piece of the puzzle, you have a piece of the puzzle, yeah. Eustace, Kathy, we all have a piece of the puzzle, Bruce. And I notice this is an amazing weekend because it's, it's, it's the light bulbs are going on in my head because there's connections that I didn't quite glue into starting to come together now, and I think for everybody in this room. So this has been, you know, well, well worth it. Yeah, well, the CIA is, I, I say the CIA is the most evil organization in the history of the world. They're involved in kidnapping kids. They're involved in the drug operation, international drug trafficking. They're killing people. Uh, they're assassinating people. Chip Tatum on my radio show said that he was involved in the takeover of 20 governments around the world where they put a puppet CIA operation in afterwards, including Australia. We, we put in the government in Australia, and now the Australian government comes out, takes all the guns away because they had that shooting down there with 26 people killed. It's all planned. Last question. Um, can you comment on the New Age movement? Can I what, ma'am? Comment on the new, what they call the New Age movement. Um, um, yeah, the New Age, uh, the New Age is pre, I don't know that there's a New Age movement right today. I think that's kind of pre-hippie day, wasn't it? Uh, part of the hippie movement back in the 60s. And, Not really. What do you, what do you? I, I think it's even bigger now, dude. Do you? Yeah. You, what do you, I haven't done any research on that. Can you comment on it? I can. I'm curious. For instance, um, there's a lot of people out right now that are teaching, um, working with personal um, light vehicles in, to do with sacred geometry, da 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 that right. kind. Okay, so that's what I mean. In Astrology and that sort of thing? Yes, but th that, um, I mean, I do that work, and I'm sure in hell not a Satanist. Well, no, I, I don't, I'm not saying that every New Age person is involved in the satanic movement. 
but I, I know that a lot of the people in the satanic movement are involved in astrology and, and that sort of thing. But uh, just because I make a statement like that doesn't mean it applies to everybody. Yeah, I don't know that much about the New Age, really. Are there any New Age experts here that want to comment? We're all through. I'm going to put my shoes back on, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks.